Welcome back to the Carpanger Chronicles podcast. We have got a serious treat for you today. We talk with Ben Pinnegar from BP Milling about all matter of things regarding carp. Ben owns his own feed company. He's also a fisheries consultant, a fish breeder. He's heavily involved with the aquaculture side of the game and has worked alongside fisheries such as Horseshoe to not only stock them, but also enable them to get the absolute best out of their water as well as their carp. So the guy obviously has a lot of inside information. The chat that we have is absolutely fascinating. And if you're into that kind of technical side of things, you're going to absolutely love this episode. Before we jump into it, of course, we are brought to you by Carp Hunter Giveaways, .co.uk please go and check those guys out they are absolutely awesome really really nice guys as well they obviously run prize draws for all manner of different tackle bivvies bed chairs you name it they run prize draws for it so go ahead check them out carphuntergiveaways.co.uk and before we lean into this episode i need to announce the long-awaited hook baits that we are going to be producing are very nearly ready we've had countless messages about this I have a list of people who want to um, be first refusal for these and it's absolutely extensive so I know it's caused a lot of excitement and they are soon going to be here. That is it for the intro, let's jump in to the interview with Ben Pinnegar. What are you drinking? Um, I've actually a local brew from um, some friends down the road, it's a little farmer friend who's He's uh, they bought out a brewery and it's uh, it's a blonde ale, is it? My, yeah, blonde ale, nice, good gear, fly monk, little plug, nice. We're well, recording now, yeah. We're recording, mate. Yeah, Ooh, a blonde God, ale. Man. Yeah. yeah. See, that's they're like they're kind of like fruity, right? Like yeah, it's fun. nice. Yeah, easy drinking that. Mm. I'll drink anything really. It all depends where uh, time of year. I drink a cider in the summer and all sorts. So I've been drinking cider recently actually, but yeah, blonde ale at the minute. You wouldn't be a proper West West Country lad if you didn't drink a cider, would you? Surely. No, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anything Definitely. really. Posh boy, what are you? So I'm on the same as our last podcast we recorded, mate. I'm on the Tap Room Hopster Session IPA. Um, I'm doing these at work at the minute, so I'm coming into the office and it's quite bad because I filled the fridge up at work with beer. And considering I work at a leisure centre, um, <laughs> it's, it's not the best look, is it? <laughs> but <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> Bye, mate. I'm the same as you. I'm. I've gone for the same as the last podcast, which is Atlantic Pale Ale. That's some proper job. Just a few of those. Keeping yeah. back to my Cornish roots. Not that that's where my roots are really, but I lived there for a while. So yeah. I don't. I've been drinking recently, but is it only because you two said, "Oh, we're gonna have a beer and that, and have a have a chat and a, and a few drinks." Oh, Christ, I better, <laughs> better get back on it. Then. Hey, you it's got been it. a long time since I've had a drink. But, yeah, I don't yeah. think anyone. Do you know what? The only person, even um. Even even Julian Cundiff, who doesn't drink alcohol, he had an yeah. alcohol-free one. But yeah. the only person that hasn't had a drink with us, a beer with us, was I think it was Tommy Bish. Well, oh, Tommy Bish definitely shame it as well. No, good old Tommy. I like I like Tommy, but yeah, he had a tea. I think everyone else has had a beer with us, haven't they, Pete? Yeah, mm. I think so. Yeah. Anyway, Ben, fill us in. I mean, not everyone listening to this podcast might know who you are or, you know, Probably how you are. started yeah. into your your awesome kind of journey into yeah, fish farming and feed um, producing, etc. So just kind of starting yeah. off at the beginning. Where, yeah. where did it all start for you? How did it all start and how did you move to it now? Um, well, it all started through, I live on a farm, pretty lucky where I live, um, on a dairy farm and from a farming family, um, dairy and arable farm, both sides of the family, both grandparents have been, uh, have been dairy and arable farmers. And, um, so I've grown up in Wiltshire and Swindon on, on a dairy farm there. And, um, one of my dad's friends got me into fishing. Um, he took me down, we got a, an old like, farm pond and he took me down there as a kid. I'm, I'm kind of much older than sort of seven or eight and, uh, took me down there float fishing. And, uh, I just, just loved it from then on knowing that, well, not knowing what you're going to catch because it was sort of a mysterious farm pond. You didn't know what was in there. And uh, I didn't know anything about fish. I thought, oh, this is, like, you know, I don't know what you're going to get. So uh, from then on, that's just sort, sort of what got me into fishing. And he took me out a few times um, as a kid. And then uh, what happened then? And then, uh, yeah, went to, when I finished school, I just wanted to get the, I've seen an advert in one of the papers somewhere or in one of the fishing magazines at Sparshot College with Net in a Lake. 
Um, no, it was on Linear Fisheries website when they put their news up. I think Sparshall College has been there to net one of their stock ponds. And I thought, what's this? And like a college that actually like they catch fish for, for the, like for, as a, as a as a course. And I thought, oh wow, I looked at that. And uh, yeah, then uh, soon enough, I was at an open day at Sparshall and met Viv there and had a look around the college and a bit of a an introduction to the course and whatever else. And then. Um, yeah, from then on, that's, that's what I was going to do. I was like, this is it, this is what I'm doing. So yeah, I studied hard and I knew the grades that I needed to get. So uh, I was pretty focused on getting those grades because um, probably because my brother uh, wasn't quite so, um, he didn't have such a vision. as Well, he did, no, he did. But he sort of, he was sort of, went to college with his mates and sort of buggered about on a sport course doing rugby and that. And uh, and uh, that sort of, he, he didn't really need the grades. So he sort of buggered about school, had a right laugh and went to college, had a right laugh with his mates. And uh, and yeah, for me, I wanted to get on that course. So I knew that um, what I, I needed to get my grades to get on that course. And uh, yeah. so I, at school, I sort of knocked down to make sure I could go. And of course, um, as it turned out, I got pretty more grades than I needed. So I wish I'd messed about a bit more really at school. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, there we go. Went to, went to Sparshout and... Um, the two years there, that was amazing. The best couple of years of my life, really, just mucking about and uh, being with your mates. And the course is a dos, really. It was, it was just the second, the first year was four days a week, and I boarded down there. So you sort of you got plenty of time to kick around and muck about with your mates, and uh, and uh, then you're doing a lot of practical work back back then. Um, so we had like two practicals a week. So it was only really two days of the week doing lectures and and sort of pen to paper sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it was just a just a good crack, really. And just uh, had to say for two years, went down there and, and did fishing management. On my first year, I had um, work experience. You have to have a work placement. I couldn't find anywhere to go. Couldn't find anywhere that would take me. Um, so yeah, in the end, Viv took me, uh, gave me the contact details for Andrew Ellis, who um, he takes a few students every year back back then. And uh, so yeah, I couldn't find anywhere to go locally or or anywhere for that matter. And uh, so yeah, eventually went went and uh, stayed at Leamington Lakes when Andy was there, and um, went on work experience with him there in a few lakes. Uh, did those two three weeks of graph with him, getting in the cold water, doing the crap jobs, and um, and yeah, I went back to college, and then uh, I kept in touch with Andy. Um, uh, I think he knew because I sort of I was from a farming background anyway, sort of anyway, so I wasn't really bothered about getting up early and 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 cracking on as such as uh, you know some people that aren't as lucky to. To have been born into a farming family like I have and had to, yeah. to deal with that sort of crap really so so yeah I, I um I, I we kept in touch um and then in the second year I went on work placement with Priory Fisheries uh, it was Ben Gratwick at the time and Tom Down was working with him right. um and now Tom's Tom's bought the business I believe and then it's Tom Down down there and uh yeah that was a good cut, two or three I think it's three week placement you go on and uh Went did three weeks at Priory Fisheries and learned a lot there. There's a real nice carp farm and still sort of keeping an eye on them and uh, doing uh, do some quality fish down there and, and you know, learned a lot through doing that as well. And um, uh, I left college and uh, this is when it all sort of um, lost my way a little bit. It was sort of everyone everyone was at, you know went to sixth form all my schoolmates and stuff and uh, they were all. St- just sort of going to uni and mucking about still. And I was like, right, I need to find a job. And uh, seeing everyone else doing what I was doing at college, going and getting pissed every weekend. And then, uh, you know, having a bit of a social life. And I was like, right, I need, need to find some work. And uh, I couldn't find any work. For, well, no, to be fair, I had a, a work placement up at, um, it's like a, almost a work experience. He'd give me like two weeks work to see if I was any good up at um, Sport and Leisure Fisheries. Dave Rant, still keep in touch with him actually. I see him quite a bit um and yeah he um he, i stayed up there for i think it was a couple of weeks and he just just sort of sussing me out if i was any good but while i was there i had a, an ea an, an environment agency interview lined up afterwards and uh did the two weeks there working with him that was all learned a lot there as well similar to priory fisheries really, and being a carp farm um uh, dave's been doing it years and years but so he's graphic to be honest but um but yeah i went left there and went to the environment agency for an interview and they got me back for a second time and, and made a, made me an offer. And uh, that was at the time when me and Dave were sort of speaking about opportunity there at, at Sport and Leisure Fisheries. And when I said, oh, I've got this interview and they want to pay me X and sort of, it sounds, you know, cushy job, they only have 40 hours and a week and then they uh, do, do whatever else and uh, sort of manage your own hours a little bit. And it sort of quite appealed to me a bit. 
And he was like, oh, you want to go work for the other side, do you? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, the environment agency didn't have much respect, but then that was probably 10 years ago now, 11 years ago, in fact, I think. Um, so, uh, so yeah, they were sort of the enemy for um, for a lot of these uh, uh, operatives in, in the fish world. And uh, so, yeah, that then I went, went and sort of thought about that, and then it meant moving down to Exeter, and I was only 18. I thought, oh, I can't want to do that, really. So I was out of work for a bit and just sort of scrapped and I didn't want to go and work in, down in Exeter. And uh, I, I probably should have done, probably should have done all these things really looking back, but I don't regret anything now. But then um, what happened then? Oh, and, uh, a farmer friend got in touch and uh, he said, oh, there's a company looking. I was probably spent a couple of weeks scratching my ass looking for a job. And uh, the farmer friend said, oh, was, uh, uh, we work at the company. They're looking for a driver doing this uh they do bull semen. It probably, if you're in the farming industry, it's it's pretty usual to talk about bull speed semen. And so yeah, they were um, looking for a driver to deliver it around the country. And uh, it was it was he just give you a, like a. I, I met up with a guy, and it, was, it meant that I could stay at home and sort of go out with my mates a little bit still. And it wasn't really much of a commitment. It was just sort of get these deliveries done. And I quite enjoy like driving around the country, visiting farms anyway, being from a dairy farm myself. And um, so yeah, it was, uh, I went, went and did that job del- delivering uh, bull semen around the country. And uh, so really, it, it was pretty rock bottom after <laughs> even college going and delivering a load of cows <laughs> around the country. Yeah, the only <laughs> way's up, right? Yeah, all my mates were delivering their own spunk and I was doing the cows. But um, yeah, it was, yeah, I carried on doing that for a year. Um, but yeah, it was pretty cool. I managed my own hours and I'd work it as if I'd get up at like three in the morning and do the, do the round by sort of, do all my deliveries by sort of two and then go meet up with mates and muck about for the afternoon. And it was pretty good for a year. I had it pretty sweet for a bit. Um, and then, yeah, all that went to crap. I think his business was struggling a little bit. Um, but then the, I went to work on the farm after that at home, went thought I'd give it a crack for a few years, see how I fancied that on the dairy farm. And um, it just sort of consumed my life for about three or four years, which was fine because it meant that I couldn't spend any money. Um, so I was just saving just banging the hours in and saving um and that's what made me um the, the sort of savings that i had I, I put into developing the ponds on the farm um and sort of i ended up uh digging one out a lot bigger to about a half an acre the original one that i spoke about where i first learned to fish and was, was introduced to fishing so yeah. is this a is this a pond on on it's your on your farm yeah it's, uh, it's on your family's farm yeah right? that's right yeah yeah it's which, a little which farm is pond. which is down uh, near Swindon, you know, um, near Lynham is sort of more local. Lyrf Lynham, what it used to be, right? You yes, know, yeah. I grew up in uh, well, just outside Cirencester. Oh yeah, yeah, not too. So far, it's not yeah, not a million miles away. No. <laughs> so this is your your family farm. You're on the yeah. pond. Yeah. And you've basically been given <laughs> you've been given the green light to sort of do your own thing on it, right? So how, yeah, how did you start doing that? It was well because it was just a bit. It's got like a wet valley in, in on, on the farm, which is only it was only ever used for grazing a few young stock in the summer, so as you know, the cattle in the summer, and um, it wasn't any good for anything else being so wet. Um, so uh, yeah, my dad knew that I I would uh, you know been to college and I I had amounted to nothing really going from college to um. Uh, to driving bull semen around around the country so um <laughs> he sort of let me let me carry on and dig that pond out so I think this time I was probably still I remember being on the phone to Andy when I was doing the bull semen job um saying that um you know any went to work I, I'm still around you know to, I'd be keen to, to to get involved and I think I probably went out on a few jobs with him during this time still Andrew Ellis at A Fisheries went on work experience with um so yeah, we were still in touch, um, and I was we, yeah. So I think he was giving me a little bit of work at this this time, and um, so yeah, I went back to the farm, uh, working milking cows and 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 the, the harvest in the summer, um, and then yeah, started to uh, develop this pond and, and got someone in to dig it out a lot bigger, and bought a load of carp from Andy. That's right, a, a thousand two to four inch carp is what I had off of him. Um, and yeah, they went into this pond that I just restored, drained it down dry, limed it and all sorts, and got it got it ready to ready for the first batch of fish. Um, before this time, I'm going back again with the start a bit. Um, we stocked it uh, when I was at college with Framlingham Fisheries, some fish from Framlingham Fisheries, mm-hmm. and they all got otted and, and flooded out. So yeah. so uh, 
coming back to where we were now. So I have had carp in there through college um, and it was just a bit of a project through college, um, just mucking about feeding them and you know, mm. fishing for them a little bit. At this point, are you, I guess, and you're a carp angler, right? It, hence your interest in spar shoal and yeah. the lake. And... Yeah. I think I went to college with about probably three years, like proper carp angling. Well, I say proper carp angling, didn't have any money. So it was all sort of um, <laughs> a crap little, you know, Argos set up as, as you yeah. start off with. And uh, then was going to like Welford Pools. You heard of that one? Well, pools probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I used to fish there and linear and just going sort of um, doing like a few nights here and there. And that, so I went, I was at college, you sort of had something to talk about and you caught a few fish. And you know, everyone that goes there was at the time probably still are all carp anglers and all carpy and want to talk about fishing all the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd done a bit of fishing up to this point. Um, well, I say a bit quite, I was loving it. I used to do as much as I could through the summer holidays and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it, from up to then, I was sort of fishing in my own pond and was watching these fish grow. Um, but obviously, working, well, being at college, um, uh, I didn't have a lot of money, so I was feeding just wheat, rolled wheat off of the farm. And this is all where it sort of started, I suppose, early on. It's the, the rolled wheat that the cows were fed. I was like, taking a bucket down to the pond and just chucking that in just to give them something. And like, occasionally I used to go to Hinders and buy like a, when I had a bit of pocket money, I used to go to Hinders and buy like a sack of pellet, just a, a 25 kilo sack and feed that. That would last me probably three or four months just because I was bulking it out with, with wheat. And uh, yeah, feeding the carp on that and watching them fizz and stuff. And it was uh, they started to grow. And what, what I bought it was... I think they were like one pound carp and they were all like commons, assuming they were as, um, mostly commons uh, from Framlingham years ago. And then, uh, yeah, I started to find the odd carcass on the on the grass and at the point I didn't know what it was. I thought, oh, that's weird, one's died. And then uh, slowly it got down from probably about two, 200 fish that we put in originally would come down to about, you'd notice probably a dozen through the summer. Mm-hmm. But they're getting bigger because they had a bit more space. So there's probably a dozen that are about, I don't know, ten pound. I was feeding them on like wheat and stuff, whatever I could have off the farm. Um, and yeah, so that's how it all began. But when by the time I'd um, where are we? By the time I'd sort of done a couple of years on the farm, saved a bit to do this pond. There wasn't any carp left, and and we stocked with rudd as well originally, and they'd all gone as well. So everything had been completely wiped out by what I'd, I'd say now is an otto or, or mink, perhaps. But um, and then they obviously had a flood took a lot of fish out um at one occasion but um so yeah that when we drained it down there was nothing left literally probably a handful of rudd um so that's when i dug it out and started again really and, and fenced it properly um put these a thousand carp in from andy um and yeah they they started to to carry on no was, that's that's when i thought right taking it seriously now i've got a bit of money saved from working on the farm and i bought um probably coppins or scratting one of the two uh, fish meal feeds and I bought a ton of that and, and fed them up and they were loving it they'd grown like stink um, mm. and I thought this is easy like it, all these fish farmers the only thing they're doing wrong is not feeding them enough and I was cracking on <laughs> chucking it in they were having it and then uh, come the winter the first winter I thought um, uh, uh, you know run the net through it and uh, Andy sorted me out with a few sales and we'll thin them out and you know me and Andy kept in touch and at this point I was probably working through him with him through the winters and then working on the farm um when he didn't want me um so yeah he, he, he found me some sales and we got the first health check and when we netted it the first first harvest um we did from the pond they just they looked they were big but they just looked ropey and they had like ulcers a few of them were had like dropsy if, if you don't if you're not familiar with, with, with fish and, and stuff it's probably a bit foreign those words but um like yeah they just didn't look great and they're producing a lot of mucus and i thought bloody hell what's going on here like they look brilliant all summer and uh that they were just they were just weren't looking great and um what what andy said to me at the time well it's probably to be honest all this fish meal chucking in you've put in so much food and it's it's probably a peak in ammonia which can lead to a, a world of problems and and that sort of stuck in my mind a bit and i thought yeah maybe i wasn't convinced at the time so um i started he suggested started to feed a few more cereals and and sort of dilute the fish meal that i'm putting in and um because that's probably what it is ammonia just too much in the summer too much ammonia and and they're um they're picking up all sorts of problems so um so yeah i started the next the following summer i started feeding a bit of rolled wheat and stuff and uh at this time i 
because I was sort of a bit sort of down about I've been to college, studied fishery management, fish nutrition and all sorts. And there uh, I had my two, two years, well, two uh, work placements, two different years and thought, thought I knew it all. And then I uh, went back to the nutritionist saying, oh, the fish haven't done as well as, uh, as I thought, you know, it's been to college, done two years of studying all that. And uh, a bit annoyed that they haven't, you know, they look a bit crap. What's going on? And then uh, I said, oh, I want to feed them the best diet I can. This is what I've been feeding them. But we think this is... Uh, having a, a negative impact on the water quality and that's why I'm getting all these problems. Is there any, anything we can do with, with cereals and feeding I was told the nutritionist, I was feeding them wheat and, and this fish meal pellet, which I showed in the bag and the nutritional spec of it. Um, and he said, all right, we'll, we'll put some sort of cereal formulation together and uh, to sort of match the same spec as what you're feeding them now. Um, so yeah, he went away and, and uh, came back with a, with a cereal formulation of, to the same spec of, um, have another drink to um to the same spec of the the coppins and uh give me that and uh thought oh that's that's brilliant um but it was a blender pellet of cereals which would have come in like a, a ground form like a ground bait um and i thought right how am i going to get this into my fish it's just going to flow it's not and then i thought about looking into getting a, a a machine to make it into a pellet um so i googled that and there's a place up in cheltenham so i went and seen them and uh they showed me their machines and put like a trial batch through it and made me some pellets and I went and chucked it in and, and the fish fed on it, you know, it went to the bottom, broke down and the fish fed over it for hours. And, and, uh, so yeah, I eventually sort of made the decision to, once I'd saved enough from working on the farm, um, I, I bought this machine, um, and that went in the corner of the grain store and start, start to buy this blend that the nutritionist had, uh, introduced me to, which would be the same spec as what I was feeding already, but, but without using fish meal or high high protein or high high oil pellets, it'd be uh, mm. it'd be purely cereals, just a blend of of uh, cereals that's sort of formulated to the same spec. Um, so you you never created your own feed first; you went straight to the um, fish nutritionist or biologist, whatever you'd say. It was well, it was the the same nutritionist that works on the farm. He he does nutrition for all sorts of animals, and he right. he's, he knows so many. Like he works with so many. Um, manufacturers and suppliers that he was the obvious guy to go to so um i went to him and and, and uh he's if he could talk on that for hours and hours about because because he works with like with dairy with cattle and and and, sh and sheep and, and and whatever else he, he works with all sorts of livestock and uh, the fish digestion and nutrition is uh like so their, their digestive system is, is so much more simple because it's monogastric compared to like um to, to ruminant species like cows and cattle that have, you know, the stomach and the, the digestion process is so much more complex. Um, fish to him was a, was a doddle once he'd sort of looked into a bit more about aquaculture and stuff and uh, knew that he'd be a good contact. So yeah, he, he sorted out the blend and the formulation for me initially. And um, the first year, yeah, the fish sort of, they, they grew as good as they did the previous year, but they didn't have this, these issues I was getting with the condition and the, the ulcers and the you know the, the redness and the dropsy that I was getting when I was using fish meal entirely, um, and that's sort of the moment that it all twigged really. I thought, bloody hell, I was this is it's as simple as that, and, and uh, it's the same pond, same size, same number of fish, but the fish just grew the same amount without fish meal, and they just looked a hundred times better. Um, what what is that? These dropsy. Dropsy is um, it's it's like a, it's, it's basically a, 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 the, the the scales on the fish um, they start to go like a pine cone. It's where it's um, it's like a, a, a uh, it's like a sort of immune response of the fish where they they can't um, uh, uh, they can't like uh, regulate their, their the waters as well. So they retain water and the the, the scales on the fish start to sort of go like a pine cone and you'll get um, fish retaining water and they, yeah. they look, you get drops you, is, is when you see like the gut is, goes real deep because they're retaining a lot of water and it's to do with like the regulation system of, and, and like that basically like a, a, an immune response to um, when, when things start to shut down and the organs don't start to, to process correctly. It's, it's like a, basically a shutdown of the system really. And it, um, yeah, they start to retain water and the scales start to flake out. We see it a lot on match fisheries. Like you see it when 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 places are overstocked and the ammonia triggers it as well. Um, and it, it's it's basically yeah, it's 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 to do with stress and uh, 
sort of the shutdown of, of the processes of the fish um, and not being able to regulate their water. So they retain it and and they just sort of, yeah they blow up you, you you can see them to look at um the scales go all, all flaked and uh, uh yeah they uh, the, the eyes start to pop as well and yeah we see it a lot on match fisheries where they're completely overstocked and stressed um, you get it in um goldfish as well yeah, a lot, yeah. don't you and, and home home fish keepers mm-hmm. have it a lot mm-hmm. yeah is, it, is that something once once the fish is showing signs of um it can be repaired it can do, yeah, but it's, it's, it gets to a point. Um, most extreme cases, no, it's no turning back for a lot of them. But um, I can imagine like the early stages of can be reversed. Um, but we only see like the the extreme cases are obvious. Um, yeah, and they've gone too far when they look like that, really. Um, but yeah, that that was sort of the the, the turning point for, for me is seeing the cereals do the same. Um, uh, get the same growth from the cereals, um, and, and yeah, that's when I, the, the year after that I didn't feed any fish meal at all because I, I thought or I, was, I was convinced enough that I wouldn't need the fish meal, and it was going to save me at the time I was spending a grand a ton on, on the fish meal pellet. So um, yeah. I, I sort of steered straight towards cereals and thought I better get behind this idea of I'm making the pellets myself now. I'm starting to sell a bit. I better get behind the idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, the following year was the first year I, I didn't spend any money on, on fish meal pellets, just fed my own feeds. And a lot of it's to do with the environment. It's it's it's, um, it's more about creating a fertile environment, um, which as you'll see me bang on about all the time now, but it's about creating the environment that, that um, for a healthy food chain, a thriving sort of algal system as well that, that supplies enough nutrition naturally and then you're just supplementing it with a bulk food source you're just giving them the fish the fish something to feed on and an environment that they're happy in and, and they just grow and it's a sustainable growth as well so they grow and grow and grow it's not like you're chucking fat like fat at them and protein at them to to put the weight on them which obviously for a fish farmer if you're if you're um if you're wanting to get first year fish to big c2s you just want to pile the the fat and the protein onto them because then you because you're selling them by the weight not the size so you, you can sell your customers fat and, and, and muscle just by chucking the chucking the high protein high high, high fat, fat at your fish and they're just going to bulk out and then you're, you're making a good margin because uh you know your, your fish are expressing um fat weight as well as uh as muscle from the from the protein but it's non-sustainable because you, you're putting too much muscle around the fish before their body's fully developed and before the carcass structure's fully um established and it's i think it holds fish back later on and uh, the trouble is you, nowadays you see people saying oh that one's a grower look at the shoulders on it and they'll there'll be fish with like two inch shoulder they look like arnie they've got like a two inch shoulder above like a tiny little head and it's they, horrible so, isn't oh, it? people yeah. see people see that as like oh that's going to be yeah. a big one. but i can yeah. tell you now look, that's not healthy growth and it's not going to live long and it might grow quick now but that'll slow down and um all the big fish in the country, they, they're long fish, they're, they're full framed fish and they're healthy and they've, they've got that to that size over a number, a number of years. It's not, they haven't got it to that size quickly. It's all done through sustainable um, growth of the, you know, the, 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 the skeletal structure of the fish and um, giving that fish a healthy lifestyle to, to really um, to, to thrive and, and, and enjoy its life. And uh, being stress-free is a lot of it. It's, it's less about what you're putting through the fish's intestine and more about, the, the life you're giving it really and for yeah. me food giving them food is is reducing stress and it's uh it's giving them that that healthy long life that, that they can grow into a healthy frame and be big fish for the future um and that's like i say is there's, there's no compromise um to, to being a, a massive fish that doesn't they, they, if they if you want to get them there quick then uh it's a long game really um yeah we i mean you want a big framed fish you don't just want a yeah. heavy fish you know you nah, don't so want yeah. a short fat thing like you say with huge shoulders yeah. i mean you you mentioned about creating the the ideal aquatic environment for mm-hmm. fish to thrive in let's take me for an example i've got a pond with with some fishing which i use for testing different um different things on how would i go about creating that perfect aquatic environment for my fish and i know that's a well, tricky question yeah well if, if it's an indoor system is it, i guess it is that's outdoor, what you've got or outdoor, outdoor. if you've got so you've got a biological filter yeah yeah so um that's it's basically about creating a biological filter but it's outdoors so in your your system's got a biological filter which is the the job of that filter is to convert the ammonia 
into into nitrites and nitrates which is then uh feeding like the food chain so so maybe it will be an algal growth which you've then got your uv filter which the job of the uv the, the uv filter is to club the single celled algae so that it can then be tracked uh, be uh, extracted by a mechanical filter of your 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 physical filter to to remove the the algae so um so yeah that the the your biological filter is is doing the job of filtering out the impurities in the water of the, like the ammonia and the pollutants in the water into healthy forms which are then converted into forms that can be physically removed from the water by the by the filters so in the in a lake environment we're basically trying to recreate that by all the organic waste needs to be broken down um like the ammonia needs to be broken down into nitrites and nitrates and then into we haven't got a uv filter so it'll be broken down and used probably absorbed by either weed or algae so uh and a single celled system like a, an algal bloom on a lake that you might see in like a a, a high stock fishery where the, there's too many fish that that uh, rooted algae systems rooted weed systems can't establish so um so yeah you you, you get the, the the inner um in like a single celled algae system is you've got the nutritional value available to put from the algae because it's being absorbed and breathed by the uh, like filtered by the fish whereas in a weed, rooted weed system you um you haven't got that a lake in question sort of close to me um suffers with algae blooms they've had blue green algae on there right and it it's like i was i don't know how to differentiate between like a, one algae bloom to another algae could bloom but yeah. it's they're pretty serious i mean this year it was horrible yeah. yeah um the water was disgusting it's like a chocolate brown yeah. um and then when it sort of dies off it all floats to the top and then you've got that real bluey green sort of color floating on the yeah. top i don't know a lot about it um i've been told yeah. it's a it could be like a sewage issue um yeah yeah um well really algae is um it's 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 a bit of a for a lot of people, it's a, it's a scare word. People are scared of algae, and, and uh, it sounds like you know algal bloom screams like problems. But for us, algal bloom is is, is healthy because it's, uh, it's it holds nutrient value to the fish, and it's it's um, it's you know it's a it's a food source for the fish, which is naturally they're absorbed by they're fully absorbed by if you oppose it to crystal clear water, gin clear water. Like from a from a filtered system, all the goodness is taken out. But it, like in your pond, we're just talking about the your uh, pond there, Sam. That's uh, uh, you know, it's, it's completely filtered through. So it's, there's no nutrient value to that water because the biological filter's removing it all. Whereas in a, a lake, you haven't got that. So um, in in like a, if you've got an algal bloom, it's uh, there's all sort of thousands and thousands of different algal blooms and. And yeah, there's there's good ones and bad ones. Like say the blue blue green algae, the algae that can be toxic and, and problematic. It's all as well. You can imagine in, it, it's all to do with water temperature. With um, with uh, you know, the, the warmer the water, the, the faster the bacterial processes and the organic processes are. So then you've then got the bacterial action from the the the, 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 the you know the bacteria is all using oxygen. So it's converting those those um, uh, like the your ammonia into nitrate much more efficiently but by doing that it's using a lot of oxygen and then you've got the respiration of the algae that are then feeding off the nitrates and nitrates and it's all to do with temperature because obviously the al the bacteria that are much more active in, in the warmer water temperatures um and they're doing their job much more efficiently in converting everything but they're all using oxygen and then they're they're feeding algal blooms which are also respirating by respirating i mean Produce an oxygen through the day, but uh, through the night they're absorbing oxygen. So that this the oxygen's peaking at uh, last last light as the sun's you know given a full day of UV light, which the the algae's photosynthesizing and producing oxygen. But as the the sun dips down and and, and the sun's setting, you've no longer got that UV energy to produce the the the, the which is feeding the photosynthesis and producing the the oxygen and the the single celled algae, the weed and and the the algal bloom is basically. Uh, taking oxygen back in so the oxygen starting to dip and dip and dip and dip until like first light is going to be at its absolute lowest and then when the sun comes back up again you're going to get that uv uv light hitting the water and uh photosynthesis happening again and the oxygen picking back up so um like the different algal blooms you you get is yeah it's it's uh algal blooms for a lot of people's yeah they, they they panic straight away but for us it's about keeping it sustainable so 
you do that through aquatic planting, obviously weed, uh, any lakes that are real weedy, um, the weed is absorbing the, the ammonia and, uh, 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 and sorry, the, the, the nitrates. So it's all being absorbed by the, the weed, which is obviously doing the same thing as the algae, but, but algae can be a lot more aggressive in, in the, the way it comes on and the way it, it crashes as well. So with weed, you don't get those, those steep crashes that you get of um, an algal bloom, uh, a microscopic algal bloom. Like, um, you know, you, you, an algal bloom that can come on quite strong is, although it's, it's, um, it's producing a lot of oxygen, it's also respirating a lot quicker as well. So any, any algal bloom that comes on quick, I will always get worried about because it will probably crash quick as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, algal blooms to me, it's, it's about managing them, um, which you do with plants and planting species that are going to help absorb the nitrates to to take less of the, the food, help to absorb the nitrate value in the lake so that it's not completely absorbed by the, the algal bloom or the weed. So it's all about, yeah, having a good um, marginal plant structure, which is all a lot, there's a lot of content that goes on Andy's profile, my profile is, um, is about uh, marginal plants, but there's a reason for it. It's all about absorbing those nitrates that are in the lake to, to take away the food that the, the weed and algae want. So, but like I say, it's all about the, the, the warmth of the water and the processes that are sped up by the warmth. And obviously you've also got the process of the fish that are, and, and the feeding activity of the fish isn't a lot more elevated in, in the warmer water. So it's, um, yeah, it's all to do with the, 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 the warmth of the water to, for everything to do with fishery management. Everything's so, so much more delicate in the summer because um, you've got all these processes happening a lot faster and everything's a lot more active and, th and thriving. You've also got the, your fish are feed, uh, uh, reproducing. You've got the fry that are absorbing oxygen. The, and the water naturally holds less oxygen. Um, the warmer it is, the, the, the poorer the water's ability to hold oxygen. So it's, it's got a poor, poorer ability to hold oxygen and a, an elevated uh, oxygen demand from bacteria, the, the respiratory process of the weed and algae, the, the, you know, the, the fry and everything else. Um, and yeah, obviously the respiration of the weed and the, the algae. So it's all to do, yeah, water temperature, and, and it's all about setting up the, your fishery through the winter to um, to, to reduce all these uh, these potential threats and the factors that are contributing to the water quality um, being so inconsistent in the summer. So yeah, fish just love it, consistency of water quality, and um, your algal blooms that come on quick, they'll they'll uh, change the chemistry of the water entirely. So that's why you might see of an algal bloom, the fish fishing can either get brilliant or crap. Um, and, and that can happen pretty quickly because the chemistry of the water is changing either in the favour of the fish or, or, or not. So, and the fish take a while to climatise. And uh, any a lot of people that, that are like fishery managers, they they can't see that and they think, oh, Christ, the fish fishing crap this year. But it might be because of inconsistencies of the water quality, the oxygen or anything. So then they'll look immediately for solutions. And the obvious one is restocking, which is the one the, the one thing that it, it isn't. It's just circle then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and presumably, sort of like you're looking at your bite times on a lake, that's going to be greatly reduced, isn't it, with increased temperatures? And yeah, 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 you tend to see that um, it's early morning and evening, some in some places, isn't it? And it's uh, yeah, it's uh, some places that are affected more than others. Um, but a lot of it again is is strength of the sun, and the, the fish just just want to be in the in their most um, comfortable environment, which is often in, either in the upper layers and areas that they're unbothered by by any anywhere where they're not getting stressed really by the predation or um or anglers or any they just want to chill out to be honest when it's that warm they, mm. even in my ponds it although fish are digesting their the the most efficient water well the, the, the optimum water temperature for fish digestion is 26 27 degrees that's when they're converting their diet most efficient, efficiently and the enzymes are working most effectively in their intestine to convert their diet but that is it uh, that water temperature is is critical for you know for the the oxygen demand of the pond is much much higher and everything's on so much more of a knife edge i i actually bring my feed rate down at those temperatures if when water temperatures get that warm everything's everything is on such a knife edge in the pond that i actually bring the feed rate down and allow the the algal blooms and and the natural sources of nutrition and, and nutrient in the pond to uh to produce, like you know give fish a bit of food and a bit of nutrition because i'm trying to protect water quality as much as i can and that's all coming from sort of feeding fish meals and uh seeing the impact they have and then and converting to cereals and, and seeing how how much safer it is to feed them 
I actually go the extra the extra pit further is when it gets that warm that, that your water quality is really at a premium. You need to look after it. So I, I actually bring the feed rate down when the fish are actually converting their diet most efficiently. So it's, yeah, it's a funny one. It's um, for me, it's more about the feed, the growing season, which is obviously the warmer months when the fish are digesting the diet more efficiently and more active. Though that's actually for me, it's more of a marathon. Whereas people see, right, let's get this. It's all about what you're putting through the fish intestine. A lot of people think, but for me, it's it's about protecting your fish's environment and, and keeping them happy for that period. So I'm trying to do whatever I can to to reduce the risk of inconsistency using water qualities, oxygen. And then just giving the fish a food source. And for me, the only way to do it is with cereals because it's a food source that fish will eat and they'll digest. And I've, my processes now are, are all um, the, the, the mechanism, the, sorry, the processes that I've got in the, in the, in the mill that machine the, the, the cereals into a pellet. They're all designed around maximizing the digestibility and the palatability of the cereals. Um, so yeah, it's given the fish a food source that's that's not going to put pressure on your water quality. And and yeah, again, a lot of it's through learning with Andy that that um, the higher your biomass, the more fish you have, um, the more more feed you have, fish you have, no, sorry, the more feed you have to put in. So it's the more pressure you have to put on the water quality. There's more pressure on oxygen. There's more pressure on everything. The more fish you have. So so for me, it's about keeping your everything just a healthy balance, really. And and uh, everything comes into that and that's what like, like i say is, is uh when i say everything i mean like your plant structure and your um it's the whole ecosystem you're looking after so you're trying to get all the the waste of the the food the organic waste from the leaf uh, matter and the silt you're trying to get it all converting efficiently so you've got you need your plants there to to absorb those nitrates and so you don't get an aggressive algal bloom if you've got a real shallow pond although it's warming up real quickly and the fish are growing real quick the organic processes are, are producing, are, are converting everything so efficiently and creating these nitrates that something's going to bloom, whether it be a, a weed, um, a rooted weed system or a, or a microscopic algae structure. Um, but for us, it's, it's about having those plants there to buffer that a little bit. If you didn't have the plants, there's nothing to absorb those nitrates and, and uh, that, that are produced by the, the breakdown of the organic matter that, because the, obviously the bacteria, like I said, is, is very, very active in converting it all. If you've got nothing to absorb that up from your, your marginal plant structure, then uh, it's, it's going to have to go to the be, be absorbed by either a, a, an algal bloom, which is going to be very, very aggressive. Um, or you're going to have, yeah, if you've got a rooted weed system, you're just going to be uh, feeding the weeds. So um, for us, it's I always pull the weed out of my ponds at the, in the spring. If you start to get a little bit of weed come up, um, my ponds are manageable sizes, so I can just get in and, and, and pull it out manually at this in the spring before it becomes a problem. Because if you leave it in there, the fish, um, they, that weed structure is going to, it's going to be absorbing nitrate, but uh, it's going to be growing into a physical plant, like a physical, um, a weed. So and that's, although it's creating um, an environment for invertebrate life and, and large food items and natural food items for fish. And that's when your anglers say, oh, it's full of naturals and all this, that and the other. For me, I want the water to be coloured and, and having sort of a, a consistent algal bloom because that's uh, constantly being fed through the fish. That algal bloom with the nutrient value that it has is constantly being, the fish are fully absorbed by it. So for me, it's, it's, it's offering them uh, a trace elements of, of, of nutrient 24 hour seven, 24 seven. So with, with a, rooted weed, a rooted weed system, you're not, you haven't got that. You've only got, um, uh, you know, large invertebrate life that live in there. And then you've got this also so creating very localized temperatures. So you've got real warm spots in, in, in uh, weed, which is up to the surface. It'll be really warm. So the fish want to be in there. So they'll spend all day there rather than swimming around like they would be in an algal a microscopic algae system they'll be swimming around um because there's no feature no weed or anything that's no localized um uh preferred spots that they'd be in whether it's warmer here or there with a without weed it's all consistent so the fish are constantly moving they're constantly burning energy so they're constantly able to feed and and that's that's the way we we keep our our, our ponds and ecosystem balanced and and consistent through the summer just by getting that out See, I, I can understand why that why you'd want that in a in a fish farm situation, yeah. but but say I mean yeah I I, I fish some waters that are choked with weed, crystal clear yeah. gravel pits yeah, on on the Cotswold Water Park, which I know you're familiar mm -hmm. with. I would look at those waters and and maybe wrongly think well, they're real rich natural 
very healthy aquatic environments for the fish and the fish look amazing as a result yeah. uh, am i am i wrong with no. that or is it no. just the application of it yeah i'd say it's the year class of the fish as well when they're young and small obviously the food items they're not going to be feeding on the, the stuff that the, your, your big carp and like and you like you said in your gravel pit it's, it's weedy the food that they're eating, the natural food in the weed, is is, is a predator for first year fish. So they'll be feeding on like the, the fry and stuff. So, so yeah, that it, it, I think it's a year class thing as well. That um, uh, you'd want your your smaller fish because they're developing their their skeletal structure and everything early on, and all the all the trace nutrients in the in the uh, in the algal system, the microscopic algae system is is going to be um, a lot more beneficial to them. Although it would be to big fish as well. Big fish, um, that I guess they're, you're not going to get that uh, microscopic algae structure because there's a lower stock in density. If you um, if you've got like a low stock water, the, the water obviously from the sorry the sunlight is going to be hitting and penetrating the water and getting to the deck of the gravel pit. So you're getting uh, that rooted weed weed being uh, growing. Um, whereas if you had a real high stock of fish, obviously the fish are keeping it disturbed. Um, so the the, instead of having weed, the the, the nitrate's been absorbed by by microscopic algae. So, for me, um, that the big fish will grow in either because they, um, I think they grow more in a, in a in a gravel pit when they're like you'll see, like the, the situation you're explaining. They grow more in there because they've got space, um, and and they you've obviously got the anglers bait and bits and pieces, and they're, and they're happy. I think a lot of it's it is about fish husbandry and, and keeping them keeping the fish um stress-free really and, and in a, a big weedy lake like that they are stress-free but it's you have also the more weed you've got the more inconsistent the um the oxygen is as well so yeah. it's yeah it's kind of yeah it's, it's getting the balance that you've got the the weed under control so you haven't got those inconsistencies but you've also got fish that have that are stress-free and uh in, the, in a happy environment with, with the food source so, so yeah you, you you tend to well, in my experience anyway you tend to get a narrower window of of bite time or or mm-hmm. you know i mean i know a fish will fe- feed whenever but generally there's this kind of like bite time that becomes very apparent um, yeah. and it changes throughout the year i've noticed yeah. that is a lot more apparent on weedy waters now is that yeah. because of the oxygen crashes and and uh, surges etc yes that's definitely a lot of it um i think if, if you're a fish in one of those lakes when the sun comes up and it, it warms up the upper layers you just want to chill out and and sort of dot about i suppose and be in the upper layers in a nice weed bed absorbing the sun um you don't want to be on the deck where it's if you've ever swam in a lake where there's uh where it's a low stock that, that the, the you've got the thermal layers of the water and if you ever swam in a lake yeah, like that and you can really feel it can't you so yeah. um on you if you if you drop down to the lower depths you can feel how cold it is i think that's a lot of it and and then again having a uh i guess in the it's more that what you're explaining is more in a low stock pit where you've got those thermal layers whereas in if you had a very high stock pit where it's more consistent through the water column you, those are the more normally the lakes that fish reasonably well through through all hours because it's more consistent i'd I'd say i'd say look disrupting those thermal layers and given the consistency of water through the water column uh, that probably helps the bites through the day because the fish aren't looking for those localized warm spots to sit in and they're more um focused yeah. on you know being a fish and feeding and, and... yeah and i mean the the, the way i and please correct me if i'm wrong the way i understood it um and obviously you're the expert here and i'm definitely not the, what I thought the case was is obviously, I mean, carp needs a, a decent amount of oxygen to digest food. Um, so obviously they're only yeah. going to feed when when they have that at their disposal. Mm-hmm. And then the weed at certain times, obviously it produces oxygen and then at other times yeah. it withdraws oxygen from the water. Is, is yeah, that right? That's, that's probably, yeah, that's probably got something to do with it as well. I'd say if, you, if the fish are, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the... The lake that I fish, uh, the syndicate water that I'm on, it's it's very much in the summer. It's it's morning bites um, only, really. The, the afternoon doesn't do much. Um, you hear a few fish show at the last light and first light, but you, I'd probably say yeah that they're spending the days absorbing the food that they've they're feeding in the morning, and they're probably spending the days in the 
in those local spots in the warmest water temperature, the, the most, most rich oxygen, oxygen, which is going to be in those weed beds that are, are thick, that are, are, there's plumes of oxygen being uh, coming off of the weed and it's the warmest part of the lake. So it's absolutely perfect for a fish to be absorbing the, their diet and the enzymes in the gut to be working efficiently to digest everything that's in their intestine. Um, so I'd say, yeah, that they're probably feeding in the morning, going and sitting in the best spot to uh, to digest their diet. Um, and and then through the night, yeah, they're, they're, they're you, on the lake that I've I fish is is you yeah. And through the summer, you, it's always um, morning bites, and then not yeah. much through the night, and then not much through the day or evening. Um, so yeah, it's, I'd say that that would make sense to me as if they they fed in the morning and spent the rest of the day absorbing it. Hundred percent in line with what I've found with those kind of clear gravel pits with loads of weed it, it yeah. just seems to be morning bites doesn't it in the summer yeah that's right yeah it's um, yeah it's although this time of year they, they say it's all changes i don't fish a lot this time of year because i'm in the lake all the time and it's don't really get so enthusiastic about fishing when you spend the day in uh, ice cold water up to your tits in the in a lake but um so yeah they say it all turns to sort of more night bites this time of year which i don't know if, if you've done much through this time of year. i mean it, i can't night fish at the minute obviously yeah, because of yeah. covid but at the minute it's sort of lunchtime it's kind of um, right, yeah. half 11 to two yeah for me i mean that that that's where i've been catching them on, yeah. on the lake that i'm on which isn't actually on the water park at the minute right um yeah. but uh yeah still a, it's a it's a weedy lake not quite yeah. as crystal clear as the water park right yeah. um yeah it's interesting it is yeah, absolutely I mean, you learn a lot as well from drone footage that we use drones now for um for uh locating fish when we're netting i don't use them in fishing but um when we're netting you see them there yeah, even in the boat when we're going around let's fishing you're in crystal clear lakes you'll find fish just hanging in the water just um so yeah i'd, I'd say that you zig this time you're just as effective as anything else really because the fish yeah. are just hanging about aren't they and uh yeah. a bit more inquisitive and a bit more docile although this week's been pretty mild um yeah it's uh you, you you've got to be uh you've got to be a good angler to get a bite now to um and persistent i think it's more 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 than anything is, is finding them because we notice now when you go out about let's fish in you'll and even netting we can net bloody some of the sweeps we do like 500 meter sweeps you'll get five acres of water inside the net and you can pull it in and catch bugger all and you'll go up the net at the other end of the lake and do a hundred meter sweep and, and catch bloody loads. So they, they're yeah. so localized. Yeah. And I almost feel like that puts me off fishing because the fish don't show this. I am actually the first fish I've seen show was today. That's the first fish I've seen uh, carp I've seen show for bloody months. So, um, yeah, when you don't know where they are, when you go turn up fishing, you don't, you don't, I don't use, I don't use anything that's all traditional stuff. I wouldn't use bloody drone for fishing. No. Um, but, um, yeah if you don't know where they are i feel like it's a bit of a stab in the dark because you can be you could even like cast cast your hook bait buddy a rod length away from them you ain't going to get a bite for 24 hours if the if the fish are that localized it's like you've got to be bang on to yeah. a lot of the places we go to and, and low stock places that because that's the luxury i've got is, is being able to get with andy the work that i do with andy now it's electric fishing and netting you you find out how localized they can be and um to even like I say being just a rod length away from them you, you're not going to get a yeah. bite you've got to be bang on and i feel like it's that's what puts me off fishing now is because uh you've got no clue where they're going to be and uh it, yeah it's i feel like it'd be a lot of wasting time when i'm trying to run a business that, um, that's that's the hunt though isn't it and that that's yeah, all yeah. part and parcel i was saying to pete uh i think it was yesterday uh -huh. I, the, the water i'm fishing at the minute you've got to be like on the spot yeah i've literally got got my two rigs right next to each other you know traveling yeah. up, as you'd say yeah. um but that that's all just part and parcel of it you know yeah you say about them being docile it's a really good way mm. to say it. i think you, winter you've got to be you really got to be lucky enough to get that glimpse just to just to see one or see something yeah anything that gives their their location away yeah and then i think you've got to have a kind of bait that just like stimulates them because like you say they're yeah. docile it's like they're they're yeah. really dozy aren't they and i and, think you need that you need a few things in place to like wake them up a little bit so they'll actually move and, and take a yeah bait. and that's, that's in the, the dead cold obviously I'm on yeah that. and they, they can be so unpredictable it can only take take one they can spook off of something in the winter and and that means that they might, might not go back there for a long time because you might find somewhere else that's more comfortable for them to sort of be a you know and it's time of year when they are so docile they can bugger off and, and spend their time somewhere else and settle in somewhere else and it's like we this week is a good example because it's 
it's got mild this week after a freezing cold week last week and um the wind was driving the first lake we did on monday that the wind was driving down into this corner of this lake we're doing and uh Real nice warm wind. I thought was, we'll go up to select fishing. I said, this is where we're going to hit them. They're all going to be in this corner. It's obvious. And uh, went in there and zapped around. There's nothing there. And I thought that just shows how unpredictable, unpredictable they can be. And uh, yeah, like you say, it's, it's working off getting one. If you get a bite, you, you're you on them and you want to try and, uh, you know, once you found them, you need to, uh, yeah, this time, yeah, certainly it's, um, they can be so localised and, and settle in somewhere for for a long time and uh, yeah different lakes are different we'll, we'll go some places where you'll find them in nice shallow water under a snag or something and, and other lakes where they'll be in just a deep hole somewhere um and yeah a lot of it's to do with temperature and it's they're so unpredictable it's we did one one memorable lake in the water park you might know it um a uh, large lake um uh, we did we did that and that's a big lake and and we we did well, we did uh, two or three days on there and we did massive great sweeps and um, we took out so much water and we we're pulling these nets in. It took probably well like half a day to get them in uh, each sweep and um, took taking out most of the water and uh, by the time we'd done on, on the second day and uh, we'd only caught like three or four pike and uh, it was ridiculous. And we, we thought, oh, it's just enough of this. And after the second day, we we, um, we got to the afternoon and we, we packed a chuck the nets back on the boat and we were going home we we're boating across the lake and we came across this hole and uh you probably hear was you know what's coming now but it's uh yeah we came across this hole and we thought oh, this is this is probably deeper than, than anything we've seen so far and we couldn't see the bottom and obviously you know the, the water park is pretty crystal clear and uh it was, we weren't far from the truck and we thought oh I'll just chuck a net in here so just, just while we're going home as well and uh yeah chucked like at 200 meters in there and uh pulled it in and sure enough we had loads of fish in this little corner this little hole and uh yeah we got the net round we didn't have enough to get it right round so Andy ended up chucking a rope to me and uh, we lost a ratchet strap and all sorts and it was uh it was just all the net was twisted like coming off the boat crap because we packed it up ready to go home uh and we just bodged it around this hole and pulled it in and we've got loads and uh that just showed to me how, how you can do you know as a 40 I don't know how big it is probably 40 50 acres and it's um we we found them in like you know an acre of the lake um yeah. in a hole and yeah we, uh, it sort of opens your eyes stuff like that and uh like i say this time of year it's it, it makes me think oh, i haven't like i can't be asked to go and try and find that that tiny little spot that they're going to be in i uh, sooner sooner be in the warm and um wait till the spring and have another go although yeah these all credit to everyone that fishes this time of year and gets keen on it. I, I, they always uh, slag people like me off saying, oh, we're, we're fair weather anglers, <laughs> fair weather Christ, angler, mate. fair play to you. But <laughs> yeah, some people on the syndicate I know and the, that I'm on and um, they um, spend all winter, you know, there might be one, they say there might be one fish out through the, through the winter and uh, yeah. it's just got, you got to be pretty keen to sit it out and, and try and be that one person that catches it. But they might, might, they might be hauling over there and just telling everyone they can catch exactly. it. Over. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do, do you change oh. your, your sort of feed composition at all this time of year from, from the fish farm yeah. perspective? Yeah. So obviously like we touched on this, um, it's all to do with water temperature, like the, the fish's digestion efficiency and the enzymes in the intestine are m- uh, much more effective the warmer the water temperature so I, I always use 15 degrees as a as the sort of turning point for me because um obviously f- by 17 degrees is, is the spawning temperature for carp 17 18 degrees give, you know give or take and then uh so i always say by 15 degrees change up to the, the higher protein feed that i do it's the bp gold the higher protein higher mm-hmm. higher oil diet because the, the the fat content in that is giving the fish energy that they need to to prepare for spawning and also after spawning when they're a bit, you know, they're tired and, and spent a lot of energy. They need that energy replenished and that fat content is doing mm-hmm. that. And the, the higher protein content is, is being, um, is being better digested. So converted into, into body weight more effectively then. Um, so I use 15 degrees as the sort of water temperature to change over. Um, and, and yeah, that's uh, through, through the colder months this time of year, we're always getting asked what, what to feed them and, and when, and, uh, I, I, there's no point spending a fortune on higher spec, a higher spec diet in the world isn't going to grow the fish any faster than a, than a, the, you know, my sta- the standard pellet that I use is a 25% protein, 3% oil, which is the, the lower protein diet that I make. And then um, that's enough to, to feed all year round. Um, but if you want that extra bit of growth and that extra bit of condition 
the, the BP gold, the higher protein mix that we formulated, that's the one that I changed over to at 15 degrees. But um, before I made that, I was feeding the 25% protein diet all year round um, for two years. And then I said to Keith, the nutritionist who I already talked about, um, I said about doing a higher spec diet and sort of chasing for a bit of growth and a, a bit more more fat and weight on the fish and, and see see how we get on with that. And uh, yeah, we came up with the, what we call BP Gold, which is 36% protein and 6% oil. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's the diet which, um, which, which does the business from sort of 15 degrees and upwards. And now that's, although the business has grown around... Um, the standard cereal supplement what it's, that's what i call it is because it, it is just a, a basic blend of cereals and it's um a supplement for the fish which is what the sort of base the business around is about supplementing the natural diet in your lake with a with a food source that the fish uh, want to eat and, and what they can digest and convert and uh so yeah I've, we, we started making this higher protein diet and that's the one now that um dominates the sales through the summer and that's that's done that so many fisheries get contacted all the time and even anglers that buy just a single sack they're like they contact me saying what have you put in this it's, it's, it's ridiculous the fish that they're saying now how quick the fish are on it and how i've got one lad who i spoke to today actually and uh he he sells my blends my cereal blends before i make them into pellet they're obviously like a ground bait and uh he's got a business selling like ground bait and uh he said that this this the standard cereal blend is is what he uses. His base is one of his mixes around, and it's, it's the best one he's got. And there's another guy, a bait company that make rolls it into boilies, and he said it's it's his best best bait uh, product. And he said that what are you putting in it? And uh, he's, I'm like, honestly, it's a cereal, a, the standard uh, blend of cereals put together by our, our nutritionist, and it's worked for us. And he said, no, come on, what, <laughs> everyone thinks I've got a secret. But honestly, it's uh, as simple as it is. It's just a food source of fish that you know is palatable, digestible, and and uh, the, I think I think a lot of it is as anglers we get we get swayed by our nose a lot. And when you open a pot of hook baits, you, mm. you make your decision based on what your nose is picking up. Whereas you don't, you don't show enough respect for what the fish are, are picking up being fully absorbed in that water. And uh, they're full of their bodies riddled with receptors. And ours, we're basing it on what we're sniffing up our nose. Whereas the fish are fully immersed in that water and whatever you're putting in that water, they can detect from, you know, so far off. And some of these baits nowadays I'm, I'm the same i'm a sucker for it you open a pot of boilies and you're oh that's gonna work that's brilliant that's strong and uh yeah but for fish i think it can be so overpowering and we can get so caught up in in what we're smelling and 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 make another decision based on that that for me i think the fish find my blends is, they're so subtle that they're confident in feeding on them um yeah. and that's why particles are so effective and with a lot of it a lot, a lot of the for me, I think the industry has grown so much. It's it's um it's all very, it's an economy on its own. It's 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 become a business, and um the market's there that are, want to catch more fish. And these bait companies promise that, and they work, and so people everyone's happy. Um, but when it comes down to it, it's it's fish that want food. Um, and for me, that's that's what I'm doing, and it, it works just as well as. It's the same as feeding as many as many carp are caught on bread and sweet corn as they are on on uh, on boilies and stuff. But I know that that sort of I don't want to piss on all the podcasts you've had on here before talking about no, no, aminos no, and everything no. else. But but for me, it's it comes down to feeding your fish and keeping them happy and and getting them to uh, yeah. to fulfil a long long life that they're going to grow into be the future, I suppose. And then. Yeah. No, you're yeah. right, and that there's a reason they want to feed on on bread and sweet corn, and they have their own in, inherent, you know, attractive and and um, yeah. attractive quali- qualities to yeah. them. When you just to kind of backtrack a little bit, you said obviously yeah. you've got a winter version of of your feed. Yeah. Um, I mean, a couple couple of questions on that. I'm sure everyone would love to hear a little bit more about how you formulated that. Do you yeah. go? I mean, obviously you mentioned 15 degrees. Yeah. Once you get below that, the the enzymatic activity is obviously dramatically reduced, isn't it, within the gut tract? Yeah. So do you go down the route of um, hydrolyzed proteins uh, or, 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 you know, cereals, carbohydrates, no. anything like that at all to, to yeah. digestion or not? It's, it's all it's all cereal-based. So you, the, the, a lot of the diets that 
I looked at when I first um, I was sort of looking into going into sort of feed form, like formulating the blend and, you know, through the meetings that I'd had with the, the farm nutritionist and the vets and all this. And a lot of it with ruminants is fiber and, and getting the, um, so what you look at in a, in a cow diet, going back to like the dairy background and the, the, the cattle is you, when you've got the silage, um, like the, you know, the, the, your cattle diet, you want to, if you crunch it up in your hands, and it creates a ball that's not doing anything so whereas they want enough dry matter and enough fiber and in the in the meal to, in that uh, silage to open up so in the gut you want it to open up and release everything that you're putting into that um into that ration you want it to be fully like open and uh, absorbent and available to the animal so um so it's the same with, with fish but almost, almost you can get too much fiber in in fish as well that you want those starch values to to, to be um to be utilized by the fish and, and that's a, a lot of where the energy comes from i think and um and it's getting those starches uh the, the process that we use now like I, I didn't really get into like um where we were with my the story of the business as we we're up to sort of that first machine that i bought but i've now gone on to to a bigger machine and a bigger manufacturing facility which is all sort of built around maximizing the digestibility of the cereals so it's all about cooking those starches and and gelatinizing those starches to make them fully absorbed by the, and, and uh more palatable for the fish so, so they're, they're more um uh yeah so they're more the, the fish are digesting them much more efficiently and, and, and converting them much much more effectively so that's how it's all been the, the, the new system is, is built around sort of yeah maximizing the digestibility of affordable ingredients which obviously the cereals so um do you treat any of your cereals with enzymes or anything like that? No, no, it's all simple stuff. I think you can get, you can, you can sort of, the more you add to the, the diet, that I, the diets that I make and the, the, the vision of the, of the business is encouraging fisheries to feed their fish and give them a food source. Um, you see too much now that fisheries banning this, that and the other. And for me, it's, you need to, there's, if it was, I always look at animals in a field. If you, if you went, drove past a, a load of sheep which are malnourished or there's too many in there you look at those sheep and they look crap and they wouldn't have water or food and and they'd be really struggling they might be the dead one which yeah that those people would be um we're done by sort of animal rights and whatever else and you know so what animal welfare issue whereas with fisheries you can't see the fish so they get away with it so for me it's fisheries that when i first started the business feeding your fish was ridiculous that everyone you know your, your anglers aren't going to catch them if you feed them it's it sort of frowned upon so now i'd like to think that we've had some sort of contribution to making it to normalize in the fact that fisheries need to feed their fish that the fish need a food source and a lot of people it still happens now you get people um sort of they taught themselves out of it by saying you know using words like our oh, anglers baits and, and and natural food sources in the, in the lake which is it works and some like the fish we just spoke about the lowest the lower stock lakes and stuff like that they'll be fine but there's places that are commercial and they've got a stocking um uh, uh you know stocking program it's like having a field of sheep and having a stocking program there and keeping putting more and more sheep in they, where are those sheep going then what you you know you can't keep putting them in yeah. and, and not feeding them so it's um yeah for me it's a it's, it's a more about livestock welfare than it is um nutritional i think the nutrition for me like keith is the guy i use for nutrition and form, feed formulation he's he knows everything inside and out so much respect for the guy that it, it, i leave that to him for me it's i'm more i'd say my experience and knowledge is in fish keeping and, and animal wealth you know yeah. fit the uh f- f- making your healthy fishery and and a big part of it is feeding them and, and reducing stress by feeding and uh, protecting your water quality and for me that's i you get asked all sorts of questions um like what you're, you're saying with enzymes and stuff but that what i was going to say is we're, we're, we're putting things like your enzymes in and, and stuff that are going to improve the, the digestion efficiency of your fish um through supplements um i think that the the, the cost it's putting on the feed it, it sort of doesn't justify feeding so it's almost like you're putting the cost per ton up, up um so then you sort of for me it's my products are all about encouraging fisheries to feed their fish so it's 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 not about what you're feeding it's more about feeding the fish <laughs> so it's like I'm trying to get back to the the issue of of um commercial fisheries not feeding and then looking for a solution which is always stocking 
Um, and it's trying to steer fisheries away from that and looking after what they've got, which is tricky. Like I don't say it on social media because um, a lot of our, you know, a lot of like, the industry experts and friends of ours are, are fish farmers and you can't go on social media saying stop buying fish. It's, you know, because that, that's their living and, and they're the reputable people that give good advice as well. But, but at the same time, you've, you've got people that look to them for a solution and those they're fish farmers. They want the, they make their living from selling fish. Whereas we are fishery consultants. We make our living from creating a healthy environment and the two clash a bit. So we don't, we always try and we don't sort of push, you know, stop buying fish from X, Y, and Z. Cause you know, that we're all, we're all, it's all part of the, the economy. Everyone's trying to make a living and it's, it's, it's tricky. They, they, they clash there. So for us, it's about, um, encouraging people to look after their fisheries without sort of so that's why you don't get fishery fish farmers saying oh um sort of put, putting loads of business our way because they they know that we're going to tell people to stop buying fish um because yeah it's it, we the amount of places we go although very lucky to have the job that i, I do with andy through the winter nets and fisheries and and surveying a lot of lakes and uh electric fishing and whatever else um that we, we get to see more fisheries with problems because we're normally called in when it's too late and they've had a problem and they don't know where to turn um then we do like nice lakes you know survey lakes where we just want to <laughs> see what the stock are we get to yeah. see more about you know disaster stories than we do um people think that we go and same as my line of work mate <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Very true. yeah yeah so it's uh yeah it's, it's more bad more sort of jobs that you're going to clear up rather than uh than uh, discover these and undiscovered mystery monsters in massive gravel pits but yeah it's all good fun it's i still enjoy it it's um like i say monday was a nice job going to uh, to see when you see healthy fish that are growing and thriving and, and looking good those are, are they're good days they're fun and it's, it's when you got to go to a match fishery that's just had a, a big problem or a big mortality issue um they're yeah they're sort of labor days where you've just got to sort of get yeah. the day done really um, yeah. but that's that's what, what I've sort of built my business around and that's what rings true to a lot of people is because we can we've got so many um experiences of of uh, different fishery management structures and different ways of running a fishery we've seen it all now like I've been doing it with Andy for 10 years and Andy's been doing it for 30 odd more than that now and uh we base all our advice on what we've seen and it's not like um we're coming up with theories that are pie in the sky or or, or came from the pub you know it's it's all stuff that we yeah uh, of course yeah yeah it's, uh, have you um have you been involved with any kind of fishery work or feed work with any famous waters i think you did something with um horseshoe didn't you you're involved yeah horseshoe the stock ponds there um when when we first got involved there um it was uh it was the, the stop pond the lagoon stop pond was completely choked with weed and algae and um yeah we we got in there and sorted that out and and that was like a, a big eye opener for the the carp society and then they did the other two so so now they've got a, a site there where they've actually got too many fish because these ponds are so productive now and producing so many fish that um yeah they've used the farrier's line blood lines to to put into their stock ponds and, and grow into to the fisheries and they've started to supply a few now as well. But, but yeah, that's a real good story that, that that's all they use is my feeds and all they use is Andy's advice. And that's just a good sort of advert for both of our businesses and the way we work together really. But um, yeah. Uh, do you mind if I go for another piss? Go for it, mate. I'm sinking these uh, mighty monks and uh, they've gone straight through. Go for it, mate. All right. Oh, weak I'll bladder be... for a 20 <laughs> Yeah, I've had for about six months. <laughs> I'm the same, mate. I'm pissing all the time. <laughs> what are you doing? Have you got a bottle? Huh? How are you doing it? If you've got a bottle there? He's got multiple, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, I've got a bladder of iron. <laughs> oh, I've got a little peanut. Well, like where we're talking about healthy balance. Um, is with these, you see a lot of pop up fisheries. I sort of call them oh, instant yeah. fisheries, yeah. sort of these lake stocking, sort of 20 pounders, 30 pounders, and yeah. it's a hole in the ground that's just been dug. And a lot of them are carp only fisheries. Yeah. Um, how does that sit with a healthy balance, just having carp as the one species in the lake? Um, it's with newly dug ponds, they, it all depends from my experience on the soil structure and the fertility of the, 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 the substrate, like I've done 
my most productive pond on the farm is the the oldest one because obviously like we touched on to begin with is it was it's an old farm pond anyway so he's got a uh, an established um the, the silt in that pond is is already fully established and silt is basically aquatic compost it's so fertile it's it's uh decomposed you know organic matter so it's if you can activate that by disturbing it getting oxygen into it and getting that bacterial action breaking it down and converting it into nitrates then getting that sunlight hitting it and p- producing these algal blooms that's a really fertile environment and that's my most fertile pond for that reason whereas from that pond um i went on to dig two more which i've not mentioned um when i just carried on working on the farm working the arse off working night and day on the farm um i i carried on to dig two more ponds and, and they were really exciting for me because they're you know new ponds newly dug exactly i wanted them nice and flat and boring and drainable and um put the fish in there the first year and i thought brilliant these are going to spawn like buggery because new pond new fertile soil but because it was so the clay was so blue and so sterile um and it was almost like a completely you know it's a it's a bathtub really and it's uh the fish they, they did well and they spawned like really really well I had loads and loads of thousands of little two to four inch carp by the end of the first summer went there put some you know the section of mature fish in there to, to grow on but but the fish i was surprised i didn't think the the fish that i put in there i think they were c3s or c4s um i was expecting them in their first year new pond to go bananas and just get massive but they just shagged and reproduced immensely um and that was probably what held it back more more really is because of their offspring being so successful um and uh, any pond is all about the total biomass rather than the, the 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 number of fish it's all about the total weight of fish in there so going back to your question of uh, um, a, a diverse species range of species in there it all comes down to your total biomass so all mm-hmm. the time i'm getting asked um you know i like the idea of your feeds but um if they break down fast the, the silvers are going to eat it first and and the carp aren't going to get a look in well i always say if you've got that many silvers that your carp aren't even getting to it then you've got a silver issue it's, it's your biomass is too high it's not balanced you want your carp to be in amongst it because you know it needs to be a balanced um ecosystem where the, the, everything's getting a share of the food so my food is just a supplementary food source of supplementing what's already there the values that are already there it's on top of that so it's it's it should be beneficial to all the fish in the lake whereas if you've got so many silvers that only the silvers are benefit benefiting you need you've got a silver issue not a food issue so get those silvers out and that's why i work with andy very closely and it works very well having the two of us but andy's cropping services and then my um, feed services if you combine the two and take those silvers out and then introduce food instead of the food you know that the, there's more space and there's more food suddenly the carp get massive so that's the sort of balance um that, that for us it's it's nice to have a, a fishery with which has got a and and, and they are if, if you if you go back and um you, you do this every year crop crop your, your, your stock and and control that stock with a, a figure of biomass in mind rather than numbers of fish and numbers of species of fish. It's all about your total figure of the biomass. So um, you can have a balanced fishery of, um, of you know, a, a specimen multi-species, but specimen multi-species, <clears throat> but you have to bring that by bio- that balance back every year because the, the more space you create, the more something's going to fill into that space. So you need to balance that so it doesn't, you know, tip in the favour of one species or the other. So it is a bit tricky. You know, you get pe- fisheries say that, oh, we're going to put perch or pike in to control the silvers. So that they almost think, right, I'll put perch and pike in. That's that done tick. With a big, you know, that's they think that in their head that they've solved the issue of, of reproduction. But the um, you need the amount of predatory fish you need to control um, the, the natural rep- reproduction official fry recruitment, as we call it, um, is is so high that you've got too many predatory fish. And again, it's that about that total figure, that biomass yeah. figure for it's us. A vicious circle yeah. again, isn't it? So it's <clears throat> if it, it get, but again, if you have a single species lake like a carp lake, this the carp that thrive, and and um, the carp, I suppose, are their own worst any en- enemy in that they're so greedy that the offspring, I and mean, there's thousands of them, they'll outcompete for the food and and leave the bigger fish sort of the but whereas with things like rudd which are more 
um, they're not so, so much bottom feeders, they're more sort of midwater upper layers uh, feeders that they're less of an issue, but they're still, they, they can quickly fit into any void of uh, any space in the biomass that they'll, they'll bulk out much quicker than the carp. So mm-hmm. for me, it's um, the, well, the carp will get to the, the food on the, the bottom, whereas the red are more upper layers. Um, you still get um, that biomass is still putting pressure on that tip, that figure to, um, that biomass figure so for me with my ponds it was um the new ponds that were so the new ones that i dug they they because the the fertility of the water you didn't have that that um the, the silt established like i had in my first pond that i dug because it was a restoration project almost like the farm pond was re- uh, enlarging it and restoring it these new ponds are completely clay completely clean like you know um completely like a bathtub and uh although they're big um they they weren't as fertile so the plants didn't take so well you you didn't get that natural um food chain kicking off as such just like in your in a um in a domestic pond where you need to establish the bacteria to to help that organic process start um because in a if it's completely sterile you haven't got that bacteria to to kick start the the breakdown of the, of the waste products so so yeah the the newly sterile pond, the new newly dug ponds, it all depends on the substrate, of the soil, and the fertility of it to to um, on how productive they are. Um, and yeah, with the uh, with my like I say, my oldest pond on the farm is always the most fertile and the most productive because it's, it's, it's shallow and it's uh, it's got that silt there that from years ago that sort of starts the food chain. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's all been. A, a learning curve over the years that is uh, it all makes sense now but it's taken sort of 10 years to sort of realize through seeing other people's fisheries and and managing the stock and when you go places that are only sort of crop their stock every sort of I don't know, every five years some of them or every two or three years they're missing out on on you know uh, it, those that do it every single year they're always so much more, more further like further ahead because the, the balance of this particularly fish is um uh, being so that the recruitment of fish is so productive in the right environment that the balance of the the, the stock can quickly change over a six month period. That, um, and we're know, talking about sort of fisheries here rather than yeah. fish farm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or well, in a fish farm as well. I get that in my ponds. Um, I had ended up that first year with that first pond. I had more total weight of offspring than I did in the the. The, the crop of fish that I put in there to start with. So, mm. um, yeah, it can just, it's just, just needs managing. And that's what is, is what we do is, um, is, is managing the population of the fish to swing in the favor of the species you want. Um, and then understanding your biomass to know what feed you're putting in as well it is all key. And, uh, but yeah, it's, you don't see many fisheries that, that there is definitely a gap in the market for, uh, gravel pits are almost a bit different but like clay pits that are really productive they they almost believe that they're, they are the most fertile pits that we go to and they need can the population he's managing every single year as gravel pits can be less productive because i think because you've got that, that clearer water and the weed structure that the fry can't get get the nutrient that they need early on to um to, to grow and, and to get to a size where they're going to survive a winter um, in a gravel pit. There's so much in, a, in like a weed, a rooted weed system. Well, like I said, with the invertebrate life, you've got living in the weed, they're all predating on fry. So when a fry is first hatches, they're, they're game food for, um, for any, and such a diverse range of invertebrate life in, in the weed that um, they don't always, they don't, well, they rarely survive. You don't see in many weed systems that, that, carp fry have come through and, and mm-hmm. survived the winter because they're, they're, they're the food for such a diverse range of species um whereas in a clay pit where you haven't got those invertebrate life because there's not the weed structure there for for them to to thrive that um but you've all but instead of having all the, that invertebrate life you've got the nutrient value from the clay and and the, the, the disturbance of the fish is is um making that soluble for the fish to to digest and, and thrive and it, that's another big thing for, for my business is um when people say that because i don't put any supplementary vitamins or minerals into my feeds they're just food source like cereals blends i don't put any it's not a complete diet they're not nutritionally complete um but when people say you know you get you get people it's, it's often it's sort of 
uh, nutritionists and stuff that might comment on it not being nutritionally complete. Well, you've only got to look at the productivity of my ponds where the fish don't get any supplementary nutrient or vit- vitamins or minerals um, supplemented in their diet. So it's, they don't get a complete diet, but because you're looking after that total ecosystem and, and the, the, the fish uh, are most nutritionally dependent when they first hatch and they're most dependent on nutrient and minerals in their first few weeks is when they're tiny, tiny little eyelash sized fish, they are completely dependent on uh, the nutrition at that stage of their life. So they need every trace vitamin and mineral. They need a complete diet to, to survive. So in the fact that we're getting those fish to reach sort of six to eight inches in their first year shows that they're getting that nutrient value, that, that that's nutritional spec. They're getting their complete diet because they're developing to that size and, and being perfectly formed. Any nutritional book will tell you that any vitamin or mineral deficiency most vitamin and mineral deficiencies in a, in a carp diet will the fish will develop deformities or um or restricted growth on them development so the fact that we get them to that size to me says that those fish are getting those trace new vitamins and minerals from the the what's naturally available in the pond and, and that's all part of creating a healthy environment is is um is is creating that that environment where there's nutrient available naturally to fish and that's why um to me uh microscopic algae st- uh, structure and a microscopic algae system is, is much more beneficial than a rooted weed system um because you've got those macronutrients in in that are soluble in the water and and the uh microscopic algae that's that, that fish can absorb and that like i say like i said earlier those fish are fully immersed in it that um, those trace elements and, and the trace nutrient value of that water is much greater than a crystal clear weed, rooted weed system that you'd get in a gravel pit. So yeah, it's probably a, a long winded answer to your question, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's the way I see it and the way it makes sense to me. And uh, the way that we see it all the time is in all the lakes that we do, you, you sort of, you see a lot of people online now that there's forums and stuff where they sort of generalize and, they they're commenting or or making assumptions based on their experience on one water but it's so so different everywhere we go you see so many different examples i'm very very lucky that i probably see hundreds of examples of fishery management hundreds of different examples of lakes substrates drained lakes and different ways of managing them that i get to sort of build a much bigger picture over the 10 years that i've been doing it that that by now I've probably seen thousands and thousands of fisheries that um, and, and examples of how they're done. Whereas people almost look at their example and think that's gospel for the for you know that um, for everyone's lakes. But they are that every every example is different and every every scenario is different. But there are sort of trends that you can pick up that I'm lucky enough to have seen um, that and, and in my own experience at home on the farm that I've managed to sort of put them to practice in in creating my own carp and producing carp to the same standard of, of any fish farmer without using nutritionally complete diets. And uh, you only have to look at my C4 fish are as big as the, the most reputable fish farms in the country, but they've not, my fish have never seen a, a, a you know, a, a, a supplementary um, vitamin or mineral that that's put into their diet. Um, it's all completely cereal based. And uh, it's more like for me, like I was saying more about the environment and creating that fertile productive environment and that's how i create i grow fish the same rate without using those fish meal high highly nutritionist highly hnv ingredients and fish meals and marine products it's all cereal based and it to me it's it's more about the environment but you wouldn't get that in a in a you know an in, in, indoor system if you're hatching fish indoors uh, you can put as much protein through the fish as you want because that you know that any protein that uh i'm sure you're aware that any any protein that's not digested by the fish or any excess protein is, is absorbed used as energy and burnt to produce ammonia um and that ammonia it doesn't matter because in an indoor system you've got those advanced uh biofilters that are converting those that waste into into nitrate which is being filtered out so you've got those filter systems that any waste product is being filtered and the water is being filtered and purified so it's completely sterile, whereas in a lake you haven't got that. So you're going to have those peaks in ammonia and those issues that come with it. Whereas in a in an indoor system, you could you're it's fine to feed fish a ridiculous amounts of proteins because you know that any waste product is going to be filtered out. 
yeah. or the organ the, by the filter system. And do yeah, you, with, with the fishery, you've got to be aware of that. Yeah. Do Do you feel that um, the kind of upbringing in the early years of a of a carp would be would have an effect on how they would feed or what they'd want to feed on in later life? So obviously, you your your carp that that you uh, farm uh, that you rear. They're fed on cereal-based diet, obviously, as well as yeah. the small amount of naturals within your lake. Compare yeah. that to, say, you mentioned the priory fish earlier, yeah. or say VS fish, which are fed um, animal proteins. Mm. Do you think that would have, A, do you think it would have a, de- a bearing on their development of their digestive tract, on how they would absorb nutrients or what they would prefer? or And or do you feel it would have a bearing on what they would have a preference to in later life in terms of their food intake yeah i think um firstly like looking at my uh, experience in in farming with cattle it's the first few weeks of development of a calf or even like the first few hours but getting that colostrum and it's the same in, in the humans as well getting the colostrum the quality of the colostrum into the into the animal or the baby at the first few hours is critical to the the um, the development of that animal over time. So, th- with with cattle, it's it's when a when a cow calves, it's those first few hours are critical in getting the 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 the, uh, the best nutrition into that animal while it can absorb it because that ability to absorb the proteins um, is reduced in the first few hours. I'm not going to go too far into the science of it because uh, that's all sort of key ground and I, I don't, can't follow as, as that much of it. But I know it's the first few hours of the, the, getting that colostrum, the quality, and the, the animal has the best ability to absorb it in the first few hours. So so they pile up that that's, um, has a massive knock-on effect on how the animal performs later on and in, in, in its longevity. And um, it, I think it's, it's probably the same in fish. I always try and relate everything I do with fish back to sort of um, animals that we understand that are above ground that we can see and, and see develop. Um, and again, um, a lot of places we go and, and a lot of batches of fish I've seen over time that have, um, when you've taken a fish from an environment where it's completely starved and it's completely um, overstocked and, and not life not in its favour, if you like, um, I guess that sometimes they can be fish of like four or five pound, which may be 10 or 15 years old and they're, they might be completely lean. Um, and when they've gone to places where they've got space and they've got food and they're in a well, um, a well managed, you know, fishery or environment, I think that they always get really, they do really, really well. And um, I think a lot of that is probably because that fish has, has not had it its way and it's, it's not had any food. So it's adapted to being able to absorb um, any available nutrition, uh, uh, anything that's available to it. It's had to really rinse that, um, that source to and absorb it um, and, and use that in, in its favor to develop healthily and, and, and survive really um so when it's been used to being in a in a a battle of survival and gone into a a, an environment of being able to thrive they really do fill into that space and and i think um farriers is a good example of that that the story goes that they've come from a farm pond where they've been like i say really malnourished and thin and they, they weren't anything special, just commons from a farm pond as far as I've, I've heard. That's a story I've heard is they've from years and years ago, they, they, they came from a farm pond and they've gone into an environment which is productive. It's, it's nice and the depth is good so that it gets real warm. And uh, obviously it's, it's a good environment for them and they've just packed it on. And like you know, anyone knows the, 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 the stamp of fish in there, the, the average is immense. And uh, I think that's a lot to do with it is, is these when you go look at farms that are agriculture now, everything, these fish are fed for production and either, either for the table or, or the same feeds that carp farmers feed uh, to their fish that they're producing are the same feed that the standard that would be fed to food for the table for trout and salmon. So, so they're complete diets and, and they're formulated around being as uh, the best uh, digested by fish so that they're formulated around um, performance and and uh, uh, converting into flesh and, and 
and muscle and fat and, and, and it's about muscle tissue and uh, the quality of the, the muscle tissue for, for me really because there a lot of these um aquaculture aquafeed manufacturers uh, uh, uh they make their feeds for food for the table so it's all about meat quality and and it's all about the, the creating the best formulation and digestibility for fish to convert that into the best flesh quality um and i think you can go so far with that that the almost the digestion capacity of carp becomes lazy that their ability to absorb that is so easy that their intestine just almost becomes lazy because they can absorb it so easily whereas i'd say that my fish because it's cereal diets they're being fed um, which are harder to digest they've had to adapt to being able to absorb those diets it's only a theory it's it's not you know it's it's no i haven't got any science to back it up or anything but it, i'd say that it makes sense to me that if my fish have um it's all about an internal gut length that the, a, a carnivorous fish um that's converting fish into fish might be a, a, a lot different to a uh omnivorous or or a herbivore that um the the uh, internal gut length might be completely different because the they need to like a, a fish meal pellet would be much easily converted into fish flesh because it's a fish protein that's derived from fish being converted back into fish flesh. So it's much easily digested. So like I was saying that fish would probably, um, their digestion system probably becomes a bit lazier and a bit more adapted to being able to convert those easily digested proteins. Whereas my, like I say, in my cereal diets are probably harder. So their digestion has had to adapt to to really rinsing that that um, material into into producing the healthy flesh and uh, and growth. So you'd say if, if I guess in my fish if you get fed them a fish meal diet, it'd be interesting to know if they convert it better than a fish meal fed fish would. I don't know, but it's only a theory that I sort of come up with, and um, it makes sense to me. But it's uh, yeah, the internal gut length of fish is a real thing that that different species have adapted differently to their diet and their uh, environment and ability to digest different proteins. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, I try not, it's difficult because I, I'm dealing with fisheries and I try not to overcomplicate what I'm saying because it's fisheries just want to know how much to feed and when and how to manage their fisheries. I don't want to be talking about internal gut length and different aminos and different proteins because that just makes it opens a whole new kind of worms and different kind of worries. And it's the same with fisheries. The more, the more you understand about fishery management and fish ke- like water chemistry, water quality, the more you panic, but it's like having an oxygen meter. If you don't have an oxygen meter, you don't panic about your dissolved oxygen. You don't monitor your dissolved oxygen. You don't worry about it. But once you've got one then you start knowing what your water quality is and your, your, your sorry, your dissolved oxygen content of your water, you start to test it every day and you think, Oh crap, it's up a little bit on yesterday and you know, or down, I'm sorry. And it's uh, you start to worry about it. So, it's almost like the more you understand about fisheries, the more you panic and the harder it is. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's all a big learning curve that you only learn from doing it. And, uh, but uh, that's all, all stuff that you, you learn along the way. And, uh, I, like I say, I try and keep it simple as possible for my uh, customers to and, and keep it, to keep bringing it back to the real basics of livestock keeping and fish yeah. husbandry really. Yeah. I'm going to backtrack. You meant you ended on livestock keeping. Yeah. I have to ask something that's been on my mind for a while. And I'm sorry to the listeners because I'm taking this off track. When you were involved with the bull semen, did you <laughs> wank off the cows? <laughs> or were you just, just merely the postman? <laughs> no, um, it was, uh, no, it was, I didn't have to do any wanking or any hand jobs. Yeah. yeah so that, it was just uh, literally, it was ni- liquid nitrogen um so the there's these straws come they're, they're stored in liquid nitrogen yeah um i was literally just um topping up like farms would have their bottles of liquid nitrogen that i'd have to go and top up yeah and then i'd get um jobs as well for different bull semen uh what, i don't know what they call themselves um they do the wanking and i do the distributing so yeah. i'll go and yeah take the frozen um spunk and deliver it to the to the farm um but it's yeah, all that's... fascinating stuff I, i've got a client that works with defra and um yeah. and, and they go around doing a m- real diverse daily job and mm. uh that kind of thing's interesting isn't it and i think it's obviously in you or it's not in you obviously you're a you're a farm boy born and bred you don't want that in so, um, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that kind of things in you. Yeah. It's interesting that you've got um, to cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's um. I think I don't know how they like because you know how VS did the old Black Mirror thing. I don't know how they did that. Whether they used proper uh, liquid nitrogen job, would be interesting. How they did that. Whether they just stripped it and took took the spunk back and a tissue. Yeah, expand on that for the listener. So yeah, the the Black Mirror that obviously when they had that those troubles there. Um, I, th- oh, it's, it's, I, I don't want to comment too much because Viv, Viv and Simon know much more about it than me. But I know that they um, took. I, thought, I guess it was um, they must have fertilised some eggs with from from some of the fish in the in the mere that um, to, to continue the bloodlines. But that's as, as, as much as I know. They, I know they had a batch of fish from from the, the Black Mirror. Um, but how they did it, I was be interested. That's what I was saying. Uh, All right. So well, I've put yes. you on the spot. No, in my, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't want to go and say this is probably how they did it and then get it completely wrong. But I know how to, to um, deliver bull semen, but fish semen is another There's um, enough thing. of matter. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the Black Mirror was a male, wasn't it? Yeah. So I wouldn't know how they, how they stripped it or how long they'd need before it dying and being able to have um, healthy semen. But... Um, but I know how, um, like bull semen, how delicate it is. You couldn't keep it out of the mother liquid nitrogen for more yeah. than a few seconds. It had to be yeah, literally yeah. bang, bang. And if you dropped a few, um, like these, some of these things, like I, was, I remember going back to Sparshot for a, a social thing and I was between jobs. So I had this frozen semen in the back and all my mates so hey, here we go, sort of putting them in their drinks. <laughs> and it was funny. But some of these things were like 100, 100 pounds worth for a sink, tiny little straw, which would be like a cocktail stick. Um, and they were, un- I, I had some in there. I must have had bloody more Viet value in semen than I had in my, oh, well, in anything. It's bloody ridiculous. The amount, the value of the, the spunk is ridiculous. It's, um, your mates were putting yeah. it in their drink. No, I, I exaggerated with that, but right. the, you know, I showed them where, um, I showed them like the straws that what it comes in because obviously they're intrigued because spunk is hilarious and they wanted to see what it looked like. Right. And I showed them just this is, uh, you know, they, I didn't want to do because I know how valuable it is. It's like, yeah, I'd probably leave that there for now. But, um, <laughs> it's yeah, gone so. downhill, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I can bring it back on track. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> God, sorry. Right. My fault. <laughs> um, no, we, you, were, you were discussing earlier about sort of like your feed pellet and mm-hmm. how it doesn't have sort of like a mineral supplement, mm-hmm. um, et cetera. Um, and how the fish do well, but then that's something I know we spoke about it earlier. But you were sort of like going going to go into is that you're formulating sort of like a bait uh, or a boily that has a sort of like a more rounded sort of profile. Yeah, for um for a long time, I've always uh, since I started the business, people have asked me if I could put garlic into a, into a product. Um, obviously, it's got it's, it's got a reputation for repelling skin parasites for fish. And, and the same in the equine industry that f- feed into horses um, for, for repelling uh, insects for, from biting the horses. It's used in, in the equine industry and, and, and in the koi keeping industry as well for, for re- repelling skin parasites. So I thought, uh, yeah, a lot of people contacted me about it and I had enough on, to be honest. I had, I had too much to do with uh, what I was already making and, and my small machine at my first two or three years with, I was still with my first, piece of uh, milling machinery which was doing about 200 kilos an hour so i was really at capacity by the time business had grown in the second or third year um and it was running day and night so when people were contacting you to put this out and everyone's like yeah yeah we'll get around to it and so thinking i know and i haven't got enough time to do that so um yeah with with lockdown last year um uh and having a lot of time to sort of kick me heels I, I i started buying in a few different products and looking at it bit more seriously and um feeding it to my fish and seeing the how they reacted and um I, with my fish anyway i haven't got you very rarely see argulus on my fish anyway because i stop them at densities low enough that parasites can't really thrive in there but it's, you see them more in snaggier lakes where fish are more localized and it's easy for the parasites to transfer from uh laying their eggs on on a solid substrate and then being able to find a fish whether it be in a snag and being able to jump on that fish, uh, feed, jump, jump off the fish, lay its eggs, jump back on the fish, and then the juveniles find them an easy host, and it, that's how they thrive. Whereas in my ponds, they're completely barren, so there's not really any hard substrate for these argulists to hatch and lay, lay their eggs on, and then re-find a host. So 
and that my fish are stocked at a density where the fish there's there's not many there so it's hard for a parasite to find to come off of a fish lay its eggs and then be able to find a host again so they don't really get on very well in my ponds anyway but um with respect to my customers that um have issues with, with lice and we do see them all over the country they're very very common um and uh so yeah it's i i started to play around with garlic and um offered it to a few different clients a few like the, these blends that i came up with um seeing how they performed and uh immediately people said that you know fish love it or fish love garlic they they were reacting really well to it um so i knew there was no issue with palatability in, in whatever concentration i put it in at and it was working out what concentration you put it in at with it to be affordable to repel skin parasites without compromise to palatability so um so yeah it's was, it was just playing around with garlic the last 12 months and um the so i've come up with a couple of products and the one product that um you're talking about there is uh, a, a bait product which is a complete diet and it's it's um it's formulated to going off of what i was playing around with in the lockdown with garlic and all of last year to be fair with the, the garlic products um i started to think more seriously about fish health and and uh, the supplements that that are going to be beneficial to fish and the ingredients that are, um, have a reputation for being um, immune boosting for fish and and as well as in in cattle and dairy farming as, as i like say always relate it back to livestock and, and cattle that I, i've uh, grown up around and and have learned through vet visits and meetings and and uh, nutritional consultant meetings that we always have on the farm is, is yeast to always come up in in um in conversation and they've, they've always been fed to the cows on the farm and i've always had interest in in yeasts and uh started to look at what was available for and, and soluble to fish um so yeah this this product that is due to launch i'd imagine soon after this podcast comes out in the spring this year um is is using yeasts for their immune boosting properties and uh their um amino the, the complete amino um package that they offer and uh the palatability to fish it's, it's a real although it's very expensive it, i can't put these products into a feed formulation like a bulk feed formulation for my uh fishery customers because it wouldn't be cost effective it would you know it, although it offers um offers uh benefits to the fish they, they wouldn't be viable because it's you know it'd, it'd be just too expensive and to be honest it would i think you'd, you'd put it in in lower lower concentrations um but the benefit to the fish like my products uh, are predominantly based around encouraging fisheries to feed their fish and, and supplementing the natural food that's available in a, in a lake whereas this product's more about being a potent sort of health um supplement so it's sort of targeted towards the, uh, the the angling market to to make an angler want to feed this product. Uh, yeah, that's been something a bit more out of the, my comfort zone, I suppose, being more about fish welfare and and um, being more focused in on uh, you know fish fish um, giving something that's going to stimulate the fishing to feed in and encouraging the fish to feed. So, have you got all the manufacturing gear yourself? Is that are you, are you yeah. machining it like your pellets? Are you sort of like you've put the outlay? Yeah, it's the same manufacturing process as uh, my other feeds. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got the breakdown of the pellet as well. Um, so it's it's just a different packaging process and, and the the branding on the bags, obviously. And um, oh, okay. You know, so it's, it's so it breaks down. Do you say? Yes, yeah, so it's the... same same product that we're making now. So it breaks down yeah. in water. It releases the the attractants that we put in there, which is sort of USP that we, we spread around it is is being able to release what's in there and, and making it soluble. Um, and yeah, that's, so uh, presumably you'll have your, that's like a different range of hook baits and stuff to go alongside it. Yeah, yeah. So we'd, it'd be boily, um, boily sort of rolled dumbbells to match the, the, the pellet product that we make. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's all, all sort of coming together now, really, as we speak, to, to sort of finalise a, a, a hook bait to match the, the feed that we're making. Nice something you were discussing earlier again it's on the fishery management side of thing and it's when you're talking about like silt health um yeah. and you're talking about like disturbing the silt and putting oxygen in it into a lake now presumably um doing that you're 
you're, you're draining a lake down. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, no, but yeah, um, it's sort of two ways of doing it. There's, there's really about the health of your silt is a lot of people underestimate this, the use of light and air. So for, for the aerobic bacteria to break down the silt, you need the oxygen to get into the silt to allow the bacteria to work. Um, so you, you, yeah, you need the, the light to to the oxygen first to get the bacteria breaking it down, and the light to convert that into nitrates and allow that photosynthesis and the, those organic processes to convert it back into uh, mm -hmm. into plant form. Really, so having those like I've got a pond on the farm, for example, which is completely overgrown with trees, and there's trees all surrounding. It doesn't get doesn't see any light of day for for 24 hours, and. Uh, that is completely dark and you walk in there and the, the gas that comes off it is just methane. It stinks. You know, the real eggy smell that you get yeah. from silt. It's uh, that's the sort of silt it is. It's real black, dark silt. And it's, that's because you haven't got that. Um, the, you haven't got the, it's, it's too acidic for a start. So you haven't got the right environment for, for bacteria to start breaking it down. And then you haven't got the oxygen in there for the, cause there's no airflow. There's no light hitting the water to allow those, um the, the weed or algae to produce oxygen to allow those um the bacteria to work into the silt so you haven't got those processes breaking down the silt so the only bacteria that can work in oxygen uh, without oxygen are, are producing methane so that's the gas that the 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 the, the uh, is it the aerobic or anaerobic one of the other i can't remember this time of night but it's uh the what the bacteria that can't work with, with oxygen so it's they'll, they'll produce ammonia so those that gas that comes off of that and really stinks that's um, sorry, the, the methane, that's sort of the methane gas that comes off there. Um, and, and that's, it's really about if, you, if I cut all those trees to the pond in question, if I cut all those trees down, let, let light and air get to it, chuck some silt on it to help neutralize the pH, that would start breaking down. But from a, from a, a byproduct of that, you get a lot sorry, of Sorry, chuck some silt, silt on it. So siltex so it's uh the chalk a calcium carbonate product so yeah. the, that's um, yeah limeine isn't it yeah pretty much but lime and calcium carbonate are two different products we try to differentiate from each Ooh, other because okay. hydrated lime can be there's this garden lime which is basically calcium carbonate the same product it's just chalk um it's a mineral that you know it helps buffer the ph whereas hydrated lime is a biocide so that's a, a very much more harsh ingredient, which um, the pH will, will, will completely switch and sterilize. The, this is a herbicide, so, no, sorry, a biocide. So it kills anything living um, that it touches. Um, but so you don't really want to be adding that to water because it's a biocide. It can the the, the, the change in pH can be a bit harsh on the fish, and it it burns your skin if you get it on your skin. And um, right. it's yeah, it's a pretty harsh product to be chucking about. So we um, <clears throat> we tend to use. Um, calcium carbonate which is uh yeah like i say a chalk mineral which is uh, much more friendly and it buffers the ph to allow the the bacteria to work into the silt and break it down efficiently and then like i say you need those the light and air to get to it to to help that oxygen diffusion and, and uh, kick start the uh the algal process and breaking it all down and uh, really recycling it back into um into nutrient available to fish and, and make it more of a fertile environment so without the light and air you don't get that photosynthesis you don't get that finishing off of the um it all becomes a bit sort of toxic and uh, gassy so so yeah it's it's all it's big it's a bigger picture with, with silt it's it's all about when we say about taking out snags and uh over the trees that cast shade and stuff over lakes it's um it's more about the those encouraging those processes and as well as the values of the sunlight, it's the, it's the warmth as well. And <clears throat> although it sounds like a, a, a piss in the wind, or a piss in the ocean, really, with, with, with a, if you say taking up um, a, a tree in the corner of a fifty-acre lake, it sounds like nothing. But when you imagine that that shade is being cast for twelve hours a day, uh, you know, for for the whole summer, so um, you know, thirty days a month, six months of the year, that's that's a long time for a shade to be cast over that corner, and it's all these tiny percentages that um uh that, that that swing in the favor of the productivity of your lake and and taking those trees out um really does make a big difference over over the, the term of a year so um yeah you see this yeah. is very you get like a fine line with fisheries as well isn't it yeah because i like mm. a natural fishery um, yeah 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 
and a lot of fisheries now are taking this sort of line and this advice. I know the EA is sort of quite big on it with the fishery advice. Uh, it's to clear out any sort of trees that sort of yeah. like line, line a lake. And but you've only got to look back to when when I was coming into carp fishing and it, or these the big carp in my time when I was just coming to college was like the car park lake and stuff like that. But the carp got big there when there wasn't when they were barren pits. Mm-hmm. You got to remember like the, the linear fisheries and stuff like that when when the they became famous. They're completely barren, open to to the sunlight and, and air exposure. Whereas mm. now that they're established and they're overgrown, that people see the establishment and the overgrown of the trees and the, the snags, they see that as part of the success. But it's not. It's because the fish have grown into that because of what it was like before. That that's how the fish got there. But now they're big. People uh, associate the, the the size of the fish with the fishery as it is now. But um, so yeah, for for me, it's it's realizing that how the fish have got there is because those lakes were dug as gravel pits. They're completely open to the sunlight and, and air exposure, and they had all those healthy processes going on. But once all these trees and stuff and croach and snags become established and and silt starts to localize in areas, that's when you get areas that it starts to become inconsistent with with the water quality and the, the breakdown of um, the organic breakdown of organic matter and. Um, and localization of, of fish and um, yeah that's that's the the modern day carp fishery is real like has seen these massive carp of everyone tries to be like the red mire and the, the 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 big you know the specimen carp fisheries of, of the time by creating what they are there's the finished product so when the, that's what i mean by the finished product is when you see you know big head of the level when, when that fish was alive and what the carp fish carp lake they look like that's what the car park lake looked like then. Um, people try to mimic that, whereas they didn't realise that that fish got big because you know those those fisheries for many years were barren and it's only yeah, yeah. when they got recognised. But you so see, yeah, that's, that's eye opening for me. That's yeah. something I've not sort of considered in that light. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's um, it's and a lot of places manage their fisheries um uh, around. You know, they try and create. We go to places that dig. Uh, fisheries like from scratch and they'll try and put these gravel bars in and these snags in and uh, artificially but not realizing that gravel pits are gravel pits because they're extracted for gravel whether they're wet dug um, which means you know the, the, the gravel's extracted while the water's in there yeah, yeah. which is what creates the inconsistency in the depths and the bars and whatever else um, so yeah that's why they look like that and why they're gravel because they're dug for that and uh, it's not it, um, like nobody goes fishing on a lake because there's a certain gravel bar or there's a certain hole they go fish there to they go fishing there because of the fish so we try and steer fishery management fishery managers into the direction of realizing that anglers come to your lake to fish for the fish that are there rather than trying to create create an environment that the the angler wants you need to put the fish first because it doesn't you could you could have a fish with like create a fishery of bars and and um holes and whatever else which sounds brilliant on paper but if the fish aren't <laughs> if you haven't got the fish in there that uh the anglers want to catch um then they're not going to come so mm-hmm. the fish spawn but in a new newly dug lake like that but they had it at the monument is the best example really that the monument at rh fisheries when they first dug, first dug that and put bars and stuff in the carp that they put in there spawned straight away and they came through and that like i said earlier the biomass um it, it, when those carp that uh, recruited really well and you've got those offspring coming through reaching sort of um five to ten pound and getting to doubles that was suddenly they needed to get those fish out but they couldn't net it because there's all these bars and stuff in there the fish would that you can't effectively catch fish if if the lead when you're netting a lake um you need to be able to to manage your stock and if you've got bars and everything everywhere then the fish can get out so that realized they quickly realized that um that they couldn't get those fish out so they ended up draining it and leveling it all off and that's a perfect example that uh, lakes need to be if you're if you're digging a lake with carp fishing in mind you need to know that you can manage your stock and uh, being able to to balance it all up again every year if you're going to create a fertile environment you need to be able to manage it as well yeah we see a lot of these sort of freshly dug lakes they are like <clears throat> they, they make them like egg boxes i guess don't yeah because they? They, they want the um features for the anglers yeah so yeah like i was saying the gravel pits that they're they're extracted for gravel so it's um they're they're, they're good environments for fish because the 
for big fish because they um uh, like you get the, the the whole ecosystem of the weed and everything. The, uh, they've got the, the the big surface area. They're often shallow. They're warm, so um, weed starts to grow and they, they tend to thrive. But it's different with clay because um, either weed will thrive or algae will thrive, and um, it's a whole different ecosystem in, in its in itself and the mm-hmm. the, the, uh, the absorbency of the the the, the mineral content and the nutrient value of the, the fishery. It's uh, and the silt content as well. I think with, with gravel pits, you get the um, with the gravel. It's it's and if you keep it open, then then it's all converted much more efficiently um, than it is in a in a in a clay lake. But but yeah, it's all stuff you, you learn only through through. Like I'm lucky to like I said, I'm lucky to visit all these fisheries and see different examples all the time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, experience. You'll be a wanted man, mate, for lots of people <laughs> needing advice and things. About that. <laughs> it's, it's a good position to be in. Um, you sort of naturally sort of led on to sort of spawning um, yeah. and you sort of like mentioned it with, so in my mind, sort of like a lot of this snag removal um, would be sort of detrimental to spawning because mm-hmm. I know sort of you're talking about sort of like um, plant and vegetation. and Obviously that's very key for spawning and successful spawning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would have thought sort of like removal of a lot of sort of snags and things would, would negate it. But you're sort of saying with monument there, they all spawn sort of quite successfully. Like, what is a sort of a good environment for for spawning? Um, sport fish will spawn on anything. They'll they'll they they need they they they're happy to spawn on a media where they can scratch and and release their eggs and and uh, get their eggs to sort of you know submit to some sort of spawning structure to lay their eggs on is is preferable for a fish. But mm-hmm. if they haven't got that, it doesn't mean they won't spawn. Um, yeah. Often in the margins they'll. Um, they'll find plants or roots to spawn on. They'll find something, but even if they can't, they'll spawn in open water, um, and, and their, egg, their eggs will find their own way. But it's it's the survival of the spawn is always on the nutrient content of the water. So in a completely crystal clear, like we've already touched on, is there's there's not much nutrient value to to a crystal clear gravel pit. Whereas in a clay pond, which is really what really turbid, and and uh, you've got the the nutrient value of uh, the clay being almost um, suspended in the water so that this is more, uh, the, the fish can digest it more efficiently because they're fully absorbed in it. Whereas uh, the nutrient value in a, ga- in a gravel pit is either on the deck and in, in, uh, in amongst the gravel or in the weed and big invertebrate life. We're, we're so, talking about fry here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Fry uh, will, will, will get, you'll get much better recruitment in a clay pit than you, than you would in a, in a gravel pit often quite often but um it's not speaking for every scenario but for ponds like my own it's um getting the fish the carp to to turn over the water and creating turbid water that um that creates that nutrient rich environment that the 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 well like i said that said earlier those fry are so nutritionally dependent they need to get those trace nutrient and minerals through them and and, and having that environment in a clay mm-hmm. pond where it's they're fully immersed in it and it's um it's um uh soluble so it's it's it, whereas in a gravel pit it's more sort of food items rather than soluble um food content so yeah it's it's two different scenarios and um we we tend to find that that fish off even in overstocked um commercial lakes if they're if the carp they've got enough food then their their offspring will often uh, be thrive because because there there's so many fish in there that that the water's turbid and it, there's a lot of suspended food content in the water. So, um, yeah, so quite often lakes that feed the, their fish, they'll often find that that the fry recruitment is quite good because the if you don't if you're not feeding those fish, those fry have got nothing, the carp aren't feeding on anything, so they're all competing for food. So the the offspring don't do so well. But whereas if um, if you're feeding them that the, there's more food available and that they're, they're competing for food so they're turning the water over more and there's more um suspended food and, and, and mineral content in the water nutrient content in the water and it's just more fertile so yeah what i'm sort of, sort of trying sort of making a uh making a bit of story out of nothing there but it's still <laughs> two different there's there's definitely two different uh scenarios of a uh rooted weed system like a gravel pit where you've got Canadian pond weed, which is rooted into the gravel and absorbing uh, the nitrate through the through the ground and creating clear water. Whereas you've got a, uh, a, a microscopic algae system, which is like a, like a 
uh, microscopic algae which is suspended in the water and coloured water which is favourable for the younger fish in, in being submersed in that nutrient value in the al microscopic algae system whereas in the rooted algae system it's more beneficial for bigger fish because you've got bigger food items in there I'd say um, yeah. so yeah it's two different ecosystems if you like but the, I'd say definitely that the clay pits and the more fertile microscopic algae systems with the dirtier water, the, the more turbid water, they need more consistent management than the gravel pits because they're more fertile and they've got more suspended nutrient in the water. Um, and, and you get better recruitment from all species in those lakes than you do in big gravel pits. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely two different ecosystems there and, we find the gravel pits more in more sort of well both like they're two different ways of looking at it. Like gravel pits they get specimen obviously carp and pike and stuff like that and then uh in clay pits you you can find big anything or big nothing it's like if it, if they're unmanaged often you find they're all sort of holding each other back because it's so fertile that everything's thriving and nothing's really grown into anything big or but then that's a good environment for perch perch tend to thrive off neglect um and they tend to sometimes in match fisheries that are absolutely loaded with carp or, or loaded with anything um you might find one or two massive perch amongst them which never get caught and it's that's quite interesting but um on the, on the same card you you get um fisheries that we go to and we crop every year that the the, the target species that they want to grow get massive because they keep cropping everything else off but then the the predatory fish don't get that big because they're uh, not quite so um it's not swung in their favor if you like so it's, yeah it's um there's two different i guess two different styles of fishery i suppose that gravel pits tend to be sort of um if they're managed correctly then they tend to sort of balance themselves um if they're stocked correctly i'd say whereas grab the clay and and more fertile soils like that need constant management and constant correction i'd say well, I've yeah, def definitely learned some something there. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to spawning, quite often you hear people say, um, like the fish don't spawn successfully in here. So yeah. presumably that's kind of like a bit of an old wives' tale. It's just more of a case of there's different environments are more suited to sort of juvenile fish or fry rather than in other environments that are more suited to the to the bigger fish. Yeah, like people will go places quite often where they'll say, oh. It's tons of x y and z like there might be they might say there's loads of bream or loads of silvers and often you you can quite often in the summer see a big shoal of silvers and that can be a large percentage of of the population whereas people look at that shoal and will go oh my god that if there's that many there there must be x there must be 10 times that in the in the other 10 but like 90 percent of the water so um it's yeah it's 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 a funny one it's um the the recruitment of fish is all based on the, the balance of the the populations and people like I said earlier you you'll, you'll get um, predat people putting predatory fish in thinking that they're balancing the 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 populations naturally but mm. then if you've got if you've created an environment for a predatory fish like a a perch to um to thrive and they do thrive so they'll find they'll have loads of food they'll have loads of fry to eat so when the perch has got loads of food, the perch thrive. So then you get loads of baby perch because the perch are thriving. They hold themselves back because they reproduce so successfully, having so much food spawning before any other species and clearing up a lot of the fry. You actually get loads of tiny perch. So uh, the end biomass is still very high, but made up mainly of, of predatory fish because that's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's never a, uh, right but i'll put predatory fish in that's that done tick so it's, it's never a, a you know a solution it's um although they they do eat a percentage of fish of, of, of fry but they like i say they by being so successful and having a the a good share of the, a good good food source they're they're a successful population that tend to thrive and uh, be a problem in themselves so uh, yeah it's uh, it's, a, it's a funny one you see you see you try and advise these fishes what makes sense and to me when i left college when when you uh you leave college and you, well, if i left college and set up a fishery it'd be 
a hundred times different to what it would be now. I'd, I'd be putting predatory fish in there to, you know, naturally balance the the populations. But it's only through experience when you see people doing it and mm. seeing uh, seeing actually what does happen and not what you, in theory, works in your head and, and makes sense to to me and you. It's when you actually see it. It's uh, it, it, you realise that it doesn't work as it does on paper. So um. Is there like yeah. an unwritten rule on like on stocking density there, or um, my I actually like I made my own rule uh, for my own ponds to to make sense to myself. I put it it's so many different um, like every fishery is different, so I don't like to sort of advise people. I like, I tell them what I stock to give them an idea, but um, it, it all depends on your own water and what's going on in your own scenario. Because I could tell you tell you five different customers based on different scenarios no in their fisheries that you, you might you know they might not have such a good water turnover or maybe they've got too much water coming through that um and there's so many different var- variables that you can't really base a figure on so many different scenarios but for myself i i always start say because i i tend to sell all my fish by the time they're sort of c4 c5 that they're, mm-hmm. they're too big for my ponds so i've normally sold them by the time they they get to sort of mid doubles. Um, so that sort of age, pull it sort of C1, C2, C3, I tend to stock them sort of about between sort of, I don't know, 250, 300 pound an acre of fish. That That's what I tend to get the best crop from. Mm-hmm. If I go any lower than that, then I'll get weed problems and weed tends to hold back the, the performance of the fish. Like I've said, that, that they've, they become localized in areas of thick weed beds and they don't want to move all day. So you don't want to feed. And then you get issues from that, from, from parasites jumping on the fish when they're sitting in weed beds. And, but on the other card, if you put too many fish in, they don't grow so well. You've got to put move more food in to feed, you know, feed the, the biomass you've got. So you put more pressure on water quality, more pressure on oxygen. Um, and they don't grow so well. So, so yeah, it's, that's, that's another thing why, fish farmers if you're a fish farmer a full-time fish farmer you've um you've you've got to sell those fish to keep them growing if if it was that's why i've not developed more ponds than i have on the farm because if i was um say if i i've, I've, I've got the ponds that i've got if i had 10 times as many as i've got i've got to sell 10, 10 times as many fish then i end up trying to find customers to sell them to regardless of their situation mm-hmm. um so that if they want fish, they're getting fish and I'm selling them to them, regardless of whether they're going to die or not, because I need to get rid of them. Because if I don't get rid of them, they're not going to grow next year. So I'm going to have the same volume of fish next year with the same volume of feed. My outgoings are going to be higher in feed costs and my uh, crop's going to be as good as it was this year. So, yeah, it's to keep things moving, you've got to move fish if you're a fish farmer. And I don't want to get myself in that position where I've got to push fish onto customers and then they have an issue of having too many fish and then they come back to you and say oh you sold me some fish last year and they all died was well yeah you had too many why'd you sell them to me then because you know <laughs> it sort of gets yeah, yeah it's, it gets into it so i want to keep everything we do as as sincere as we can and as legitimate and transparent as we can although i'd probably make more fish more money selling more fish it's not what we're about really and i'm so passionate about fisheries and, and thriving ecosystems that uh, and uh you know pump lakes that are going to grow big fish that i, I don't want to be part of that trying mm-hmm. to make money from selling fish to people that don't need them I've, like this year i sold some fish to the water park and i donated um i gave them a donation of i said i'd want to donate sort of a, a dozen fish to, to a certain lake um because i know this angling club they they sort of they didn't have many members it's hard fishing they don't have many fish and i knew that because of that scenario they haven't got many fish they don't want to stop many fish if they put some fish in they're going to do well so i, I said that i'm happy to donate because i want to put them somewhere where they're going to do well i'd like to donate some to sort of one of your waters and thankfully they accepted and let, let me put them in they even bought the whole batch from the, the pond that um so it's, it's a batch of c4 carp and um they they took the the whole batch so it was that pond harvest all went to the same lake um the same low stock they haven't had a stock for like 20 years so the, the carp stock is really sort of very old and um is it, that i think from what i'm told this is about a 30 acre lake and they've only they reckon they've probably got 10 or 15 fish in their carp so um these 25 c4s that went in there they've got loads of space um didn't make much money on them obviously because i donated half of them and sold the other half to them because they wanted the whole batch and uh 
it's just nice to put them somewhere where you know in sort of 10 years time they're going to be beasts and uh, there's not going to be many in there even in 10 years time so um it's sort of places like that that for me that's that's where I want to be putting my fish and sort of knowing in 10 years time that some of those fish are getting caught at uh, sort of you know 20 30 40 pound perhaps and then that's that's all from something which hasn't made me any much money but it's sort of um it's something that you've contributed to and that's the sort of thing i like doing because growing carp for me is never going to make much money because i don't grow enough of them to make enough money but it's all sort of about a hobby thing or it, feeding them through the summer is all sort of a hobby and uh, spending time down the ponds and feeding your fish watching them and studying them and seeing uh seeing how they tick and, and watching them grow over a growing season is mm. far more rewarding to me than uh the money that's involved with selling them that's it. How long have you been selling fish now? Mm, I was um, when was it? Oh, I left college at eighteen, so probably must have been nineteen. So eighteen, nineteen. I'm twenty seven now, so that's nine years, isn't it? Yeah, we'll go with nine, mate. Yeah, nine years. Yeah. Um, and what sort of weights are those fish doing now? You- um, well, they in the first few years they were going to sort of venues of um that i was selling feed to so like sort of newly newly stocked sort of lakes that mm-hmm. um like sort of holiday parks and things like that so they but i wouldn't say there's i'm not that i know of many massive fish i grew them 20 pound at home um and then they've gone to sort of places that um not sort of places where they're 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 not gonna grow into massive fish it's almost like um uh, like commercial lakes, if you like, not not so they're overstocked. It's not trying to contradict what I've just said about stocking them into a nice big gravel pit. It's, if I put them in in some places like um, uh, booking places where you know you book your, your your week period or your weekend on lakes, and uh, yeah, they've done sort of twenty to thirty pound. And um, as far as I'm aware, I've not heard of any that have gone over and beyond thirty yet. But these ones I've just put into the water park. Those are the ones I'm really excited about um and we've we've got some in the pipeline as well that we're trying to uh we're, we're trying to like i saying with um some of the, the land stuff we're doing at the minute with some of the the lakes that, that might come up for, for stocking it's um those are the ones that i'm really excited about now is uh yeah just putting some fish here and there and it's just never going to be a big sort of production process and a fish farming process as much as i wanted it to be as a kid when i was left college i wanted to be a fish farmer but um but now knowing what the industry's like and seeing the amount of fisheries that have got too many, um, I'm happy just selling, you know, two or three batches a year to a few angling clubs here and there. Um, but as far as my, I haven't heard of any massive, massive fish in the eight years I've been doing it. But when I say eight years, the first two years I spent feeding fish meals and working out what the issues that come with it. And it was only sort of the last, I suppose, seven, six, seven, eight years that, with with digging more ponds that and, and feeding more cereals that um I found what I want to be doing really and uh, I think donating fish to the right places is something I'd quite like to be involved with really and, and like I say it's um it's, it's never going to make a killing selling the volumes of fish that I sell and and people probably look at a lot of the fish farmers probably when I say that I, I farm fish on them they probably think oh you look at me as a tiny little production thing but that's the way I want it to be I don't want it to be um a big um commercial thing where i because then you've got to have to hold too many fish and you, you put your pressure on yourself to sell them like i was just saying and uh, it's it's more to me about keeping your fish healthy and and opening everyone's eyes to 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 what is the bigger picture really rather than it being about the fish it's more about their environment and um giving them a food source that they want to eat um and as a as a product of all of that they grow um mm. So yeah, it's it's the, the way that's not the trendy the trendy way to look at it. the trendy way now is to look at the strains of carp and uh, um, it's all about marketing your fish. But for me, it's it's trying to sort of um, be more about the environment. Working with Andy, you can sort of. But the, the I'm happy knowing that the advice we give is is, is completely genuine. It's completely honest. And knowing that what we say, if you follow our advice, we know 100% that we can get you results. It's, it's not about trying to sell a product to trying to sell a fish. It's about the, what's best for the fish and what's best for the environment. Um, and that, like I said earlier, that does clash with 
with sales of other fish farmers that want to move fish, um, our advice probably does go against that. Um, in a lot of scenarios, but there are places that do need fish. So, it's sort of, yeah, just trying to base it all on each situation, really. And how does demand go? Because presumably it's like a lot of fisheries now just want predominantly mirrors, sort of like particular scale patterns. Um, are your fish yeah. sort of quite distinctive? Is this anything you sort of aim for? Or? Well, that's, that's another question. I'm glad you asked, really, because I think I'm quite of, of the opinion that because um, it's trendy now to buy fish from X, Y, and Z and have a, um, uh, a, a good sort of genetic pool, I suppose, and then have like different strains in your lakes. So it's very trendy to have that different people's, you know, have a nice yeah. a mix of carp in your lake. But for me, I th- always look back to to how it was historically. And you went to Redmar to catch those leany fish. You went to sort of the car park lake to catch those big chunky carp or, or braise, or things like linear, to, you know what you're going to get. And that's, I like that. I like how it's, I don't like now going to a fishery knowing you've got everything to go for in one lake. I like going to a lake knowing that it's got character, it's got fish that are from this lake rather than from, I, I don't like the way it's all got commercial and you can get everything you want from every single lake. I, I quite like the char- have a lake having character. So I try and cor- make my fish um, almost more streamlined in what they are and try and to create... Mine fish have come from sort of um, uh, what the, the, like the north of the Cotswolds. So um, the, the genetic heritage, I suppose, is from north Cotswolds. And I try and keep it that way and try and... I get You get sort of carp that come through with an almost blue colour and I don't like I like to keep them like an orangey sort of homogeny sort of colour. So they're all sort of the same uh strain if you like. And and a good fish farmer will give you a good mix of fish. Um and I think you should the one thing we always tell our customer is you I, we always suggest that you when you pick your whoever you want to supply buy your fish from, pick that supplier and use them solely because uh, I always say you only should stock your fish once with the amount of fish that's healthy for them to grow into for whatever you want to achieve, whether it's commercial or, um, or specimen. Um, and you should stock it once and you spend the rest of the time correcting the biomass. Um, but yeah, for now it's all become about stocking programs and, um, I like to sort of keep it, uh, have a tunnel vision to what you're trying to achieve. And, um, we always say using one supplier rather than mixing, different strains and different suppliers it's all very well and good but you're also mixing the strains of the parasites as well so each fish will be um will be used to the parasites it's got and the strain of parasite and the, it, it's, it's it's grown up around them so it's it's um it, you know it's, it's it's developed around those parasites whereas if you introduce new strains it's almost like it's got to do that process again and it's almost it's got a new strain of parasites and it's every, every parasite sounds like a, you know, a swear word, but it's all fish have got parasites and there's no category one or category two notable, notable parasites that are recognized on in health checks. So your fish will get a health check and it'll come back with what parasites your fish have got. And you've got your category one, which is completely normal and your category two, which, um, which they're notifiable. So you've got to tell the EA that you've got them and you're restricted on where you can put them because those category two parasites need to be controlled and they're, um, they're, they're, they can be sort of um, invasive on fish and, and fatal to some populations that, are, um, that, that don't recognise them. So, so yeah, see, so mixing those different fish with different kinds of parasites is bad news, we think, because uh, your fish have got, then got to adapt to the ones that are naive to a certain parasite have then got to adapt to this new parasite and it might be overwhelming overwhelm them it might be a stressing factor in the fish that they might be stressed for some reason or another and then this naive parasite could could be uh detrimental to them but um and that's why you see um some lakes that are wiped out by a stock um and that's what this health the health check system is is designed to to restrict and stop is is uh when you put a when you introduce a, a parasite which the resident fish are, non, are naive to, um, that's what the health check systems sort of you know, created to sort of regulate that really. Um, but yeah, like, I, I think if you're going to stock your lake, like I say, I've stocked mine with a thousand two to four inch carp from Andy, and from that batch, I've used to create 
generations of car, probably fifth or sixth generation now. Um, and yeah, it's I think that once you those fish, um, they've got their parasites that they used to. And I think if you keep if you if I stopped one batch into one lake like I've done to top pit um on the the, the lake i was just saying those, those c4 carp that's one batch of fish that have gone gone into a lake where there's only a handful of carp so there's not gonna the fish the parasites aren't gonna thrive because there's there's gonna be so hard for them to find another host because it's like 30 acres with only a handful of fish in it mm-hmm. um and yeah it's uh it's not like they've gone right this by 100 fish from him 100 fish from him 100 fish from him 100 fish from him and then mix them all together and then suddenly you get like a mix of par- like different strains of parasites different kind of parasites fish that you know uh, are naive to some strains and and, and uh, uh familiar with others so it's yeah for, for for me it's things like that that fisheries don't spend enough time thinking about but then they think about other things too much it's, um, yeah, it's, but then that, again, that's based on theory rather than like my um, internal gut link theory. It's all, it's all my theories that might be a complete bit of bollocks, but it's uh, makes sense to me. And uh, yeah, just try and uh, advise people on, on what you know and what you're confident in, really. And but that's not bad advice by one batch of fish and, and from one supplier. That's what that's how they did it in the old days at Redmire when they put whatever it was, 50, 50 little first year carp in to control weed. And all of a sudden there was 30s and 40s. Well, I say all of a sudden over a number of years, those fish accidentally became 30s and 40s and the red mire become the, uh, the, the sort of iconic fishery that everyone wanted to be like, but they're trying to get there through different means by buying different carp. And that's not how it was, how it was. So yeah, I think people try and mimic history by uh without sort of getting there the same way that history was made and um that's kind of what i want to bring it back to is fishing has become so commercial and so scruffy that you're almost um you're almost embarrassed to tell people you're an angler now because you see all these stella drinking vaping uh people that want to chuck their little their bags of litter and into a hedge and um it's, we've come from a, a sport which is so traditional and it's a hunting game and we've become almost uh, a yobbish tracky wearing um breed <laughs> to put a nice ending on your uh, podcast <laughs> nice cheery <laughs> depressed i say <laughs> it's true though isn't it yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah. there's certainly different sort of um not clicks, but different sort of groups or niches or yeah. groups of anglers, isn't there? Yeah, um, I'd like to I'd... see some class come back to the uh, to the traditional sport that it was. Mm. And I think a lot of the old old boys would say the same, that we go to a lot of old angling clubs that, oh, back in my day, boy, they say. And, uh, yeah, we've uh, let them down. There we go. We can, uh, we can only uh, try and bring it back. But, yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? It's become such a big commercial it's become such a big industry of being on the telly all the time and all this uh, modernization of the sport and the, the money that's involved with it now it's attracted a lot of uh, a lot of attention and it's going to come as part of part of it isn't it but when you yeah when you start to we've just started to try and encourage fisheries to up their prices because everywhere you go is absolutely rammed but when fisheries here that you're trying to up the price of fishing tickets they're um they're obviously dead against it so it's it's yeah we're not very popular all of the time but it's all for the greater good of the sport and the fish really yeah Yeah. definitely i mean over your years working in the industry what's been the biggest eye-opener to you that would be helpful for us as carp anglers that just basically want to put more fish on the bank Um, i'd say keeping quiet i always think through feed and fish, um, like watching them feed, where you're stood is always the the you see the least traffic of fish. You can put a drone up anywhere you go, and you stand on the bank, the least amount of fish is right in front of you. I always think that we do ourselves out of a lot of fish just by yeah. being too clumsy, too heavy footed, too close to the water. Um, I would always say being quiet and um, yeah trying to create an environment where 
you're not there almost to sort of almost keep your footfall as damp as possible and as quiet as you can and letting those fish feed in their natural environment as much as you can less so on commercial waters obviously but at the moment i'm i'm on a, a massive gravel pit with a low stock and it's it's although it's uh, it's a lot of it's open water fishing even so i try and creep around really really that was almost so that nobody knows i'm there and just try and just keep it when i'm feeding my own fish and you feed them on the surface you you can put feed anywhere and they'll feed happily but in front of you they'll never come in they'll see you and yeah that's sort of to me i think we do ourselves out of a lot of bites just by being so drawn to the commercialization of of carp fishing right you stick your bivvy up here and you you spot out and you get your mark you find your spot sorry and then you chuck, fill it full of bait and then you put your rigs on it with big leads and it's all become so regimental and so um so sort of strategic like, i don't know what the word is but you just sort of you know what you're doing before you get to the lake whereas yeah. it's that we're hunters really we're trying to catch carp from an environment that they don't want to come out of so it's sort of you've got to be uh yeah, I think for me, it's it's got to be being quiet and being stealthy as if you're not there. And for, I've got this year, particularly, I've um, uh, uh, the, the the lake I've been on, uh, quite like really sort of find my kit down to to nothing really, brolly and a, um, a bed chair and and as little as I can get away with and bivy up right back and only cast the rods out, um, pre baiting and, and baiting as much as I can. And then just getting your rods out as quietly as you can and sitting right, right back. Um, and yeah, just being, I think that's the, for me is... Stealth, isn't it? I mean, yeah, we've spoken about it on the podcast before, but it's the same as if you're in a swimming pool and someone walks up to the edge, you can hear it. Yeah. It's just, it, it's magnified underwater, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like the water molecules can transmit the vibrations better than air can. Yeah, I, I think that's scientific you, fact or not, but that's that's yeah. what it feels like in reality. You haven't even got to spook the carp to sort of for them to put them off the feed. You've only got no. to sort of quietly sort of they think something's up and they don't have to feed. And it's yeah. especially in the environments where you and I are trying to catch them from from low low stock pits. They're they're feeding as a luxury rather than as a necessity. It's like in a commercial pit where exactly. they're, they're feeding because they're hungry. That in a bar yeah. situation yeah. they're almost grazing because they can, and so you almost. Yeah, you just got. I think you've just got to be so so quiet and take yourself away from the, what carp fishing is. Whereas you turn up and you find a spot and you bait it and you put your rigs on it, you've got to really sort of. Well, that I say that, but that's only for the scenario I'm thinking of. Rather than you could turn up to a high stock pit and fill it in and catch a lot, but um, I'm, I'm thinking probably of the scenario I'm trying to catch no, fish. No, from. no, yeah, and w- which is relevant. relevant yeah, means for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, and stemming on from that, the a lot of people talk about naturals, you know, myself included. Yeah. Um, what naturals do we need to be aware of as carp anglers, and how can we learn about them, and then perhaps use that to our advantage in order to catch more carp? Um, I honestly don't know. To be honest with you, it's like I think now because carp baits are so advanced that i think they'd far rather eat a, a bait than a than a natural now um i think people get carried away with the naturals as an excuse of what they've not caught or why they 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 feel happy that um i don't know i, I to see i've i'm yet to see a carp that's to watch a carp that's so preoccupied on naturals that that's all it'll eat i think a fish that wants to eat will eat what it can to the what's available to it what what it wants i i don't know i just failed to sort of see that the this this we sit we hear it all the time everywhere we go that there's so many naturals in here mate and there's they're not gonna get take a bait and it's like i don't know i feel like i i i've got in in my ponds when the weed gets up and you can get the weed out and see so many naturals but when i feed them they just go nuts for the food and i just feel like if they're really on the naturals, they will completely strip those naturals out because carp going on a feed rate in my ponds in the summer, I, I can feed up to 5% and they'll mm. nail it. They'll feed it all. They'll eat it all in a, in a day. So going off a, like a 30 pound carp, if it say that's a 20, say it's a 20 kilo carp, say 40 pounders or something. 
20 kilos so that'll eat uh 10 percent and that's 20 so that's like 100 grams of feed every day all day every day that'll feed easily um so that's like that's a lot of naturals that so every all day every day having that many naturals i think if they're really enjoying them that much and <laughs> they'd be yeah i can't see it i, I think that especially our baits so for as an angler they're, they're so attractive and nutritionally fulfilling as well and they're so easily available that i think carp that i don't think you need to be too worried about naturals if you if you know where they are and you can get bait to them quietly without spooking them you're going to catch one i think yeah i don't know i think people get carried away with the naturals thing um but then I, there's probably people that that listen to this that can prove me wrong and i'm fully open to sort of being shot down but um I've yet to see it myself. I like to think I've seen a lot of uh, carp feeding and carp situations and bits and pieces. But yeah, I don't know. I think I think it's uh, a, a, a theory more than a, a practice. Um, but you see pit fish feeding. Obviously, we see fish feeding and fizzing up over. Well, you don't know what it is. It might be bloodworm. It might be. It, it, it could be naturals. But I think that fish can. Yeah, they probably yeah you know, they probably do in that sense, bloodworm and stuff on beds and stuff like that. But um, I I can't honestly. So I think they'd sooner take what's easiest available if there's a load of bait on the deck that is easily available and it's going to provide more nutrition to them and it's attractive to them. Then yeah, they're going to take the bait every day. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't know. Sorry to avoid your question. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, not at all. No, ab- absolutely. Absolutely, mm. I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it, and it's it's water dependent, isn't it? Yeah, everything is so subjective. That's the thing. And yeah, and you, we want like a black or white answer. We want it yeah. like, is it black or is it white? Is it yes or yeah. no? But, but it's yeah. not always you, you that hear, simple, is it? You hear stories of like carp shitting up shells and definitely small fish. Um, so I've seen fish in my own ponds that the carp that have have spawned and turned around and, and uh, eating their own fry. I've seen them charging at clouds of fry. That's the, I'd say that they definitely uh, eat stuff like that that they can easily d- digest and convert into to body weight. Obviously, converting live fish into f- fish flesh is easy, so they want to they want to eat fry, definitely. Yeah. And, yeah, so looking at it from that point of view, I'd say, yeah, crayfish and things like that, they, they, they'd eat, certainly. But I, th- I still think if there's bait that's – that's right it's uh, i think there's bait that's wrong that can be overpowering or 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 not not nutritionally i don't know not 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 easily detected by fish or or um or or nutritionally uh fulfilling for the fish i think they'd uh if the bait was right then they'd definitely prefer to eat eat um a food source that's um yeah basically a, a boilie which is is filling and it's a food source if they, they can eat easily i think they'd sooner have that but but then you have like from my point of view from feeding I, i'd never people have always asked me why don't i make a boilie as a food source but we go to a lot of fisheries that when the fish because the fish like i said earlier about the consistency of water quality fish can quite easily switch off feeding for a day or two where something's not quite right the water quality or chemistry isn't quite right and they'll they won't feed for a day or two well if you carry on feeding you haven't realized that that the fish are off the feed then you put a, a couple of kilos of boilie in that um the feed boilie so i made a feed boilie and uh we go to lakes and we net lakes and we are quite often bring out boilies in the nets and they stink and they absolutely reek and you have, have like oil slicks coming off of when when you net a like a let's say a, a spot someone's been baiting with supplementing feed in a, a fishery of boily and it'll slick up and it'll absolutely reek and you think oh we're going to find a dead fish here but you don't you just bring up a load of boily and that's that's enough to put a fish off feeding in itself so if a fish stop feeding for whether it could be a water quality issue if you carry on feeding then the boily the, the feed goes rotten and then um uh, ferments and, and creates sour water or you know the, the the fats become rancid and it just creates a horrible environment for fish to feed in there they're not going to feed on that in that zone or on that food at all and it might put them off feeding for another day or two so so for me i think i can do myself out of sales by 
making boily, then people realizing, oh, they're not eating that. Look, I found it on the bottom. The fish aren't yeah. feeding on it. Whereas with my pellet, because it breaks down, it's yeah. it's quickly um, uh, converted into healthy like nitrate for the water so it's, it's about getting oxygen into the mix once with a boiler you can't do that because it doesn't break down it's it becomes rancid it's it's a package of pollution basically and just something the fish don't want to eat so with a pellet because you get the, the water transfer and ingress and the oxygen into it it, it starts that process already so it's it's neutralizing the uh, the impurities and the, the, the toxicity of the the, yeah. the bait turning rancid so for me that if you, you Overfeeding my pellet, it's quickly converted into uh, healthy forms of nitrate for the fishery and fertile environment. Whereas, with I mean, it's really, a, you don't get that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very good point as well. I mean, you know, trout pellets, obviously, they go rancid very easily. Yeah. Or, you know, within a relative window of time, trout mm. pellets will go rancid. Mm. Do your feed pellets suffer that same fate or not well no it's, it's because of that because it breaks down it, it's the, the surface area of the cereals but once they've uh, broken sorry down, I'm, I'm talking about in storage oh right so yeah no it's um it's all about my pellets don't get any preservative or any any uh mold inhibited chemicals at all I, I, I could and it would probably be beneficial for some scenarios when people want to store it in certain containers and all, all plastic packaging but um but yeah, I don't put any anything like that in it because I don't want it. I know that as I sell it as it is, it's a food source, whereas I don't want to be putting stuff in where I'm not sure what it's going to do on the fish no. or the, the environment. No, because I, I'm selling it think... by the turn, I sell it by the turn. It's it's almost like I, I could uh, by putting that into it. If it even if it makes a tiny amount, tiny effect, it's I'm contributing to a massive like food supply across the country which i'd rather yeah. just keep it new, uh, like completely natural and um yeah yeah so. and, and i don't think scretin put anything in like that as well no. i mean people buy buy a sack they might you know it, it might be old stock they buy it cheap and then it sits in there yeah their little unit before they sell it on by the time the consumer gets it that that pellet could be quite old and it's rancid by that yeah. time. yeah yeah, it's about well, getting did yours it down suffer to that right. same fate, or it used to used, used to store it, like supply it in polythene sacks, so it, it couldn't breathe in polythene sacks, so it started to sweat in the sun. So um, since we changed the paper sacks, we had loads of issues with the polythene, but now we've changed it to the paper sacks. It's all pretty much um, a neutral humidity in the, within the bag, so it's it's all about getting it down to the right um, the production process. You need to get it right down to the right moisture and then like uh, uh, temperature as well to sort of stabilize it it's, uh, in itself so you're not you're being careful about the amount of steam i put onto it and the amount of treatment i put onto it before um before i make it into a pellet before it's formed so yeah there is like the, that was a massive issue when i first got the new pelleton plant by conditioning it with steam and putting too much moisture into it and that was a steep learning curve by realising that I had to replace a lot of feed the first year because I was putting too much steam into it, trying to gelatinize the starches and cook it too hard and not being able to draw that moisture out. Mm. So then once it's been stored, it's that moisture's trying to leak out and you're getting all sorts of issues then. But but because it's 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 all it's all organic and it's it's not it's not a when it goes into the water, it's all quickly converted, whereas with the boilie it turns rancid and it's, it's definitely something that can't break down. You've got that issue of rancidity and, and turning the water sour and, and whatever else comes with it, and it's you know that's that's bad news. So I, did, I I could obviously, if I made a boilie, I could sell it ten times over. I could sell loads of it and make a good margin. But it's almost like I don't want to do that because I know that that's going to any anywhere that has issues is going to find boilie on the deck and it's going to turn the water sour and it's just going to be bad news. So I I know that my pellet is going to because i use it in my own feeds and it's it's for my own fish i know that it's going to be fine and it's it's, it's going to break down organically um yeah break i mean down a, a, yeah a good boilie should gas up and it should float off you know when it's past yeah. its prime how much feed do you produce a year uh this year just gone i did four just over 400 ton wow. um but yeah two years ago i probably did about 100 tons so it's gone pretty quickly to uh, yeah quite a lot I'm sure we'll get flooded with messages after this and, and people will ask yeah. us about this, that and the other. 
um so yeah. maybe we can we can come back and do a part two yeah we could yeah have a look at our social media i'm sure there's stuff that you'll find interesting on there and you'll listen 100 percent. yeah 100 yeah. percent. if people want to kind of explore your world a little bit more find out what you're doing with both your feed your upcoming yeah. anglers bait um yeah. and the fishery work that you do where where do people find out more about yeah bait? so quite active on facebook and instagram it's bp milling is uh and, and the website is by the time this comes out we might even have the new website launched but um yeah i've got a new website being it's pretty much complete i've just got a few new products to put on there and that's uh www.bpmilling.co.uk and uh yeah there's, hopefully there's some interesting stuff for everyone to look at on yeah. there and hopefully hopefully this uh, podcast has been a bit of an idea of what we're about and it's uh less uh, like you say less about the, the this i'm not a scientist by any means but um certainly i've seen uh i'm lucky enough that i've been able to see a lot of fish read and a lot of livestock and uh try and uh, yeah. sort of merge the two together to create something a bit interesting in the feed world of carp but it's definitely a lot different to what you'd what you'd get from your fish scientist i'm sure like fish even now if you if you looked um for for feeds for fish you, you're going to find a lot of uh, fish meal and stuff and everything is is geared towards fish meal and that's completely i've gone completely against the grain of my business and it's only grown through um through results really so um no it's just it's been uh been very lucky to have what i do and been able to do what i do for a living and uh very grateful for my customers yeah i mean it, it sounds like you're a you're in the trenches experiencing it firsthand and you're seeing what happens at a grassroot yeah. level oh right? yeah 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 you get to see fisheries inside and out drained and, yeah. and be able to listen to fishery stories and and their management plans and and over time you, you get to see trends of what works and what clearly doesn't which uh yeah it's that there's uh, there's uh some quite big gaps of uh what's marketed to what actually works and you do see a lot of product which is you get you get to see customers that spend waste a lot of money on stuff that and luckily we can sort of steer customers in the right direction and we're through being honest and we don't make much money from being honest but you uh you get results from it so yeah, that's yeah. What, what really matters and yeah i'm sure the stuff that you do with your uh your businesses you see the same and uh and yeah being honest doesn't make much much money but it, uh you can be integral in what you're saying though. and you see the results yeah, yeah so yeah. But, yeah it's cool yeah absolutely absolutely ben thank you so much yeah pleasure i really hope you come back for a part two (laughs) cheers thanks for having me cheers guys cheers cheers buddy cheers